This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel link of the author CR. Edit is giving below. Chapter 51, Oil of Green Revenge, Room of Rewards, and Black Binders The ensuing vault cursed like the first one. One that, terrifies the dead ones. It dwells on the stage of completeness. Sheltered by the oil of green revenge. If you want to taste the reward. Accolades you need to appreciate. But are you ready? It will be anything but easy. The roads we walk have demons beneath. Are you ready to face what lies underneath? Quinn hummed in giddiness, staring at the riddle on his left and the third-year Hogwarts arithmancy book on the right. It was a pure coincidence, but while doing his arithmancy homework in the arithmancy, he noted something written on the arithmancy book. It was the symbolism of number six, and according to arithmancy, number six was the number of completeness. It was also a perfect number, and a perfect number was a rarity. A perfect number was when all the numbers divisors, excluding the number itself, are added, and the sum equals the number itself. Divisors of 6, 6, equals 1, 2, and 3. Sum of divisors equals 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6. Ancient Greek arithmancy master Euclid had discovered the first four perfect numbers, 6, 28, 496, and 8128. Seeing that Hogwarts didn't have floors in double digits, correlating this with Friar's last riddle, Quinn was sure that stage's meaning here was the floor. The stage of completeness was the sixth floor of Hogwarts. I don't want to scan the whole damn floor just to find the entrance, grumbled Quinn. He slid the riddle paper in front of him and reread it again. Last time, the riddle had minimum information about the actual vault, and it was more of an introduction to the cursed vaults in general, but this time, the entire puzzle was focused on the second vault. Hmm, now, what does Oil of Green Revenge mean? Sitting in his office, Quinn tapped on his table, looking around the room, wondering about the wording. The ticking of the clock could be heard clearly in the quiet room. The tapping of the table turned rhythmic as he tapped out a tune. Slowly all five fingers and palm came into play, performing a tap tune with his hand beating against the table. His head started to bob with the music. Slap. The sound of Quinn slapping his forehead with his other hand reverberated in the quiet room. What are you doing, man? Scolded Quinn. He got up from his chair and paced up and down in the room, trying to think of a solution. Time ticked away as Quinn tried all kinds of things like doing a handstand, laying down on the floor, sitting lotus style, eyes closed, and anything that might work, but nothing worked. After an unidentified time, Quinn ended up watching a non-magical painting on his office wall. It didn't move because of charms or did anything magical, but Quinn liked it because of its simplicity and the simplistic color palette. Colors are amazing, spoke Quinn, his eyes reflecting the colors in the oil painting. Hmm. Quinn tilted his head and rewound through his thoughts. Wait a minute. He turned his head to the riddle page on his desk and back to the painting on the wall. He repeated it twice before saying, Oil. Painting. Oil painting. Portrait. Magical portrait. Friar, you beautiful fat monk. From the start of the sentence, Quinn's voice rose with every word till he came to the final conclusion, and facts all fell into their place. Quinn didn't wait for a single second before he put on his Hogwarts robe, and while he did that, his table packed itself, and the page of the riddle flew into his hand. He pocketed the page and spoke to himself as he exited the office. Oh yeah, I am feeling it now. There is no point in being nut if you can't have a little fun. Scene break. Like every floor of the Hogwarts castle, the sixth floor was vast and grand. Full of different corridors and turns, with rooms that hadn't been opened in hundreds of years because the castle was so huge that the occupants never needed all the extra accommodations. Ghost and portraits were a charming feature of Hogwarts. Its magical nature attracted ghosts to tie themselves to the castle, while people's time in the Hogwarts castle, while they were still alive, was so significant that they liked to send their portraits to the school. Even to this day, a lot of dead people sent their portraits to Hogwarts. Maybe I will do the same when I am all old, sickly, and dead, thought Quinn as he ran his way to the sixth floor. He reached the floor and walked to the first portrait he saw. What's your name? The man in the portrait looked at Quinn before stroking his mustache as he introduced himself. Tatum Blakesly is my name, mustache is my game. Quinn cut him off and said, Tate's homestead. No, that isn't anywhere near green revenge. He looked at the next portrait. What about you? Lady Eva Horney. Quinn shook his head, from the fortress, that doesn't match either. Quinn went one by one to every portrait and asked their names. Trying to relate them to green revenge, but nothing matched. He stopped after a couple of tens of portraits and grunted, okay, this is taking too much time. Need to speed up the process. He took a deep breath and gathered his magic, and initiated the magic he wanted to use. Quinn opened his mouth and spoke, but not a single sound came out of it. But to every portrait in his sight, they could hear the same sentence. Everybody, tell me your names. Every single portrait that could see Quinn heard the sentence, and they began moving closer to Quinn by traveling between frames. Some portrait people away from Quinn also came to see what was happening and, tons of portrait people peered at Quinn from the picture frames on the walls. Quinn shrug nodded in amazement at the number, all right, a little more than I was expecting, but why not? Go ahead, speak your names together at the same time. He closed his eyes and focused, diving deep into his magic, channeling it to enable the acclumency he had developed throughout the years. 
His mind thrummed with activity, and then it came. Portraits were copies of their subjects while they were painted, which meant they too had personalities. The portraits began speaking their names, some took the lead, some followed after the first group, while others hung at the back of the group before speaking. A cacophony of names came crashing into Quinn as he sorted through every single name that was thrown at him. Bonifatius Tegula, Eustorgius Nerva, Rodichan Nalani, Amara Nero, Cyan Hennis, Adela Dreschnerg, Herbanus Lentinus, Eardwulf Fry, Madison Ecclestone, Sidonius Dorso, Rose Witta Bong, Sinaric Harlow, Eustorgius Nerva, Venditas Viridian, Hildebrand Forsbergs, Quinn visualized every single first and last name in his mind, looking at their meanings from their root language and culture. Every name appeared in front of a mental image of Quinn, and it would immediately turn into its closest meaning before Quinn would swipe his hand, and it would disappear, and the process would be repeated with a new name. Celtics, Roman, Germanic, and Old English meanings floated in his mind, tens and tens of words flashed in his mind at an acclomanciated speed that was remarkable for someone Quinn's age. Wait, a second, shouted Quinn. He swiped his hand from left to right, and a pair of words appeared in his mind. Venditas Viridian. Venditas is derived from the Latin vendita, meaning revenge, and the surname Viridian from the Latin Verides, meaning green. Revenge and green floated in Quinn's mind, and he switched the words to get. Green revenge, he whispered and slowly opened his eyes. I found it. He looked at the horde of portrait people and asked, who among you is Venditas Viridian? A lady stepped in front of the group, and that confused Quinn, you are Venditas Viridian. He thought it was a guy's name. The lady shook her head and spoke, no, Mr. Viridian left. He doesn't like noisy places, so when we spoke all the names, he left because it got too noisy. Quinn clicked his tongue and asked, where can I find him then? Another portrait spoke from the herd, why yeah, we can't tell. Mr. Viridian doesn't like that, says that it just attracts more noise. Quinn looked at the entire herd of staring eyes and asked, anyone else who wants to speak up? No one spoke and just shifted on their painted feet. Quinn was surprised by this and thought Venditas Viridian might be an important man. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you were helpful. You may leave and go back to your lives. I mean frames. The portraits weren't alive, so telling them to continue on with their lives was wrong. Sorry about that, said Quinn before walking away to a place with no portraits. He leaned against a wall, crossed his arms, and began thinking. Let's see, who is Venditas Viridian? He wanted to check if there was someone with the name in his memory. A faraway look appeared in his eyes as Quinn dived into his mindscape and started looking for anything that would mention Venditas Viridian. After a minute or two, Quinn finally found a mention of the name in his memory and was surprised to see that Quinn did know a lot about Venditas Viridian. Professor Venditas Viridian, Potiwunner, author, and headmaster of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in the early 18th century. Now, I see why the portraits weren't willing to speak about him. During his lifetime, he published a famous book on minor dark charms known as Curses and Counter Curses, Bewitch Your Friends and Befuddle Your Enemies with the Latest Revenges. A book that was still extremely famous among students in Hogwarts and could be found with a large part of the student population. In other words, he was still a best-selling author centuries after his death. Focus returned to Quinn's eyes as he moved away from the wall and exhaled, he will be on the sixth floor. It won't be difficult to find him. Scene break. Damn, it was hard to find you, exclaimed Quinn as he stared at the portrait of Venditas Viridian. He had to look at every portrait frame, and through extraordinary events, Venditas Viridian's portrait frame was the last one he found. Venditas Viridian looked up from a book he was reading and stared at Quinn, you are the boy who was asking for names. Why have you come to find me, child? Quinn observed the portrait frame, which covered the whole door to a room, and said, I want to get in there. The portrait of Venditas Viridian was guarding the room to the Room of Rewards, a secret room at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry that noted students' various achievements. It was different from the trophy room on the third floor. Quinn didn't know how it was different, but he didn't care about that. Damn, Fryer really thought this through, didn't he? If I just thought about the next part of the riddle, I wouldn't have spent all that time searching for this, thought Quinn. The next part of the riddle was about rewards and accolades. If Quinn figured that out, there was a chance he might not have to spend so much time wandering around. No, you can't. Students aren't allowed to go inside, said the portrait of the ex-headmaster. Why? Because I say so, said Venditas while going back to reading his book. Quinn squinted his eyes before asking, is it because there is a rule against entering the room, or is it just because you just don't want to open the door? The latter, answered Venditas, not looking at Quinn and reading his book. All right, if this is how you want to play. Quinn turned away from the portrait and walked to a place where a Venditas couldn't see him and took out Recon. Let's see if you are so stuck up after this. He looked at the map and found the thing that would help him show up in Ditas. He closed Recon and walked back to the portrait. Portrait Venditas sighed as he looked at Quinn, boy, I will repeat, you aren't getting dash dot. Summa premium. Portrait Venditas stilled in his chair and turned to face Quinn, what did you say? Summa premium. Now, open up. Let me through. Reveal the treasure. Get out of my way, grandpa, said Quinn, smirking his face off. He had read the password for room of rewards from Recon and now was rubbing it in Venditas face. Portrait Venditas didn't say a word as the door to the Room of Rewards opened up, but he did stare at Quinn the whole time. Quinn stared back at the ex-headmaster as he strutted his way into the Room of Reward. 
The inside of Room of Rewards wasn't filled with trophies or awards, but with shelves and shelves of black leather binders, with names written in gold on the spines of the binders. He didn't touch anything in this room because of paranoia and just took slow steps to explore the room. He didn't want to make any unwarranted moves in here. Quinn had no plan to have a repeat of the last year. After an infuriating amount of time, Quinn finally concluded that he could walk normally in this room without triggering any deadly trap. Phew, that was stressful, sighed Quinn. He finally relaxed his tense body and just looked at the room. It wasn't anything special, just shelves of black leather binders and nothing else. The first thing he did was cast tons of detections charms on one of the black binders to check if they were safe to pick up, and the result was that there was nothing on the binders other than preservation charms. Quinn picked up the binder and opened it to read it. There were tons of parchments inside the binder that told a story about a student named Paige Winthorpe. She was a student around 300 years ago, and in her time as a Hogwarts student, she was made a prefect in her fifth year and continued her way to become a head girl in her seventh year. She was a top scorer in her exams in her time, and it showed in the report cards attached in the binder. Paige Winthorpe wasn't only good at academics, she excelled at sports and part of the Slytherin Quidditch team from her fourth to the sixth year. In short, Paige Winthorpe of Slytherin was an exemplary student. Quinn picked up another binder and saw similar facts about another student and another one and one more. He went through five of these binders, and every single one of them was some kind of valedictorian or similar, someone who shined in Hogwarts in a way or another. Do I have to read all of these binders? asked Quinn as he remembered about the line in the riddle. If you want to taste the reward, accolades you need to appreciate. It made Quinn think he needed to appreciate the accolades that were written in the binders. They showed the student career of the brightest students of Hogwarts, and these binders showed their accolades. Quinn looked at the hundreds and maybe thousands of binders and dreaded going through this much material. He enjoyed reading, but only if it added to his knowledge or if he enjoyed reading something. And, he had just read those five binders and Quinn was sure that it would get boring real quick. I, I am going to through the room once again. Have to check it to find if I missed something, said Quinn, hoping that he missed something. He didn't want to read everything in this room. Scene break. October arrived, spreading a damp chill over the grounds and into the castle. A sudden spate of colds among the staff and students kept Madame Pomfret, the matron, busy. Her pepper-up potion worked instantly, though it left the drinker smoking at the ears for several hours afterward. Quinn, too, had spent an amount of time in the hospital wing, brewing pepper-up potions for the season-changing cold, helping the matron with the brewing load. In return, she answered every healing-related question he had. A profitable exchange for both. On the vault of side things, Quinn had little luck finding anything in the room. So, he had no choice but to read the binders. He would spend a lot of time in the Room of Rewards reading about many students. It turned out that the Room of Rewards was reserved for the very best of the students of Hogwarts, and every year, the professors would sit and have a meeting to decide who would be admitted into the Room of Rewards. Those binders held every remarkable detail about the students and the teacher's remarks about the student. Stunning recommendation letters and proof of character from faculty if the students needed them. Quinn was sure that if any students had these, they wouldn't need a resume for the start of their career. Just pick one of these binders and walk into a place of hiring, and they would seriously give you a look over. But, despite that, Quinn still didn't enjoy reading them, but he didn't have a choice. He just read the black binders and practiced magic while reading them. Portrait Venditas tried to change passwords, but his efforts were for nothing as with Recon, no room in Hogwarts was blocked to Quinn. Of course, except the Chamber of Secrets that opened up with Parcel Tongue. Speaking of Chamber of Secrets, while Quinn was immersed in reading the black binders, October passed, and Halloween arrived. And, Halloween at Hogwarts with Potter's fate was always eventful. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, solving riddles, reading tons, brewing medicine. Portrait Venditas, portrait of ex-headmaster, likes quiet. Poppy Pomfrey, matron, October is her peak season. Chapter 52, Halloween of Illusions and Symbols The dinner feast at Halloween was always special at Hogwarts. The decor of the Great Hall was all Halloweeny and spooky. Floating pumpkin heads from the ceiling and spooky bats flew around the dark, enchanted sky. The lighting on the Great Hall was also dimmed by a level, giving it a different feel than usual. It was oddly stimulating to see a place that you saw every day changed slightly. The goblets had engravings of pumpkin, and the food came in cauldrons instead of the usual utensils. Like every year, Quinn had put on his pointed hat for the occasion and had a pumpkin and bat lapel pin on his robes. It was his way of being festive. Plus, he had dipped into his chocolate reserves and distributed chocolate to every Ravenclaw he came across in the Ravenclaw common room. Unknown to him, they gave him the nickname Chocolate West because of the chocolate he had been giving out. It didn't help when he would randomly produce chocolate and give them to people even before Halloween. Quinn cleaned his hands and corners of his mouth before turning to Eddie and smiling, what Halloween candy is never on time for the party. Eddie gave the question a thought before shrugging, I don't know, which one is it? Chocolate, laughed Quinn. Eddie gave him a flat look and spoke, that wasn't funny. Quinn pursed his lips and nodded, I know, here you go. Placing something on Eddie's hand. Eddie looked at his hand, expecting to see the usual chocolate, but it turned out not to be chocolate. A candy cane, asked Eddie, his brows quirking up. Quinn showed a shallow lopsided grin and chortled, the chocolate is late. 
Eddie's jaw fell as he gawked at Quinn. He closed his mouth before asking, did you plan that? No, it just came to me, smiled Quinn, shaking his hands around his head. Genius, right? No, it wasn't, spoke Eddie, his face showing his complete disagreement. Both friends got up from their bench spots and started to walk towards the exit. Quinn threw his arm around Eddie's shoulder and poked his cheek, come on, admit I got you. Nope, it didn't. It did. Didn't. It did. Didn't. It did. Didn't. It did. Didn't. Quinn and Eddie walked together among the crowd of students who were going to the common room. He would walk with them till the fifth floor, then he was going to part with them to go to the room of requirements. But then the crowd of students slowed down till every stopped and stilled. A murmur spread across the students, and then all of them heard something that bought chills to Quinn. Enemies of the air, beware, you'll be next, mudbloods. Quinn froze when he heard Draco Malfoy's familiar voice. He had familiarized with it from all the times he had quarreled with Harry Potter in the Great Hall. Eddie felt Quinn's arm slip away from his shoulder and watched as his friend step away from him and walk towards the front of the crowd. Hey, where are you going? Eddie called out to Quinn but didn't get a reply from his roommate. Quinn. Quinn didn't hear Eddie as he moved through the crowd towards the front of the traffic. His fingers twitched occasionally, and numerous students felt tugs on their clothes, shifting them slightly to the side as Quinn used magic to make a path from himself. Quinn finally reached the front of the crowd and saw the scene he had read about and seen in the cinematic representation of the books. Foot-high words had been daubed on the wall between two windows, shimmering in the light cast by the flaming torches. And, not any words, but words, written in blood red, and the dripping marks certainly upped the graveness of the wording. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. His eyes shifted away from the bloody words and saw Mrs. Norris, the caretaker's cat, was hanging by her tail from the torch bracket. She was stiff as a board, her eyes wide and staring. Is she dead, thought Quinn and immediately looked at the floor to see a puddle of water. Okay, there is a chance that it might be alive. The events exactly matched the canon, so there was a chance that Mrs. Norris was alive and was just petrified. Quinn finally took note of his surroundings. The chatter, the bustle, the noise died suddenly as the people in front spotted the hanging cat. Harry, Ron, Ivy, and Hermione stood alone in the middle of the corridor as silence fell among the mass of students pressing forward to see the bloody sight. Attracted no doubt by Malfoy's shout, Argus Filch came shouldering his way through the crowd. Then he saw Mrs. Norris and fell back, clutching his face in horror. My cat? My cat? What's happened to Mrs. Norris? He shrieked at Harry, his eyes popping red as he looked feral. You, he screeched. You, you've murdered my cat. You've killed her? I'll kill you? I'll. Argus. Quinn looked as Dumbledore made his entry on the scene, followed by the professors. In seconds, he had swept past the golden quartet and detached Mrs. Norris from the torch basket. He handled the situation swiftly and immediately asked Filch and the Golden Quartet to follow him to his office, and Lockhart offered his office because it was the closest. The silent crowd parted to let them pass. Lockhart, looking excited and significant, hurried after Dumbledore, so did Professors McGonagall, Lily Potter, and Snape. Quinn felt relieved as he saw the events happening just as canon progression. It made him feel in control and brought calmness that the diary Horcrux was in the castle and not out of Hogwarts, which meant there was a solid chance the Basilisk might die at the hands of Harry Potter this year. But... Quinn didn't know that his relief would turn against him as without his knowledge, someone had seen his relief, someone that didn't have a good impression of him. Ivy Potter, the Potter princess, part of the Golden Quartet, caught sight of Quinn's figure in the crowd's front. And, something caught her attention, and when she observed, she saw a look of recognition in Quinn's eyes as he stared at the bloody scene. Her eyes widened as she saw relief and something else in Quinn's expression as he watched the wording on the wall and the hanging cat. A seed of apprehension gripped her heart as she saw him not showing the stunned and dismayed expression matching the others surrounding them. Ivy continued to glance at him with the corner of her wide green eyes as her mother pulled them away from the crowd. Without Quinn's knowledge, his hated wench had struck again. Fate had placed an impending crisis on Quinn's head, and he did not know what was about to come. Scene break. The knowledge that the Basilisk was active in Hogwarts was a positive and negative thing at the same time. The positive from the situation was that the course of events remained close to the canon progression. Quinn didn't need to worry about canon blowing itself out of the pool and the Basilisk wrecking havoc later on. The negative of the diary Horcrux being at Hogwarts was in the short term. It wasn't sunshine and daisies when you lived in the same building as the deadliest snake in the world, one that could kill you with a single look. To feel a moment of safety, Quinn had come to the room of requirement to think about, something. He couldn't think much about how to handle the basilisk. Quinn's first priority was to stay away from the serpent and make sure he and the snake never met. He had no delusions of taking on the basilisk. If it was blinded, then I would take my chances, thought Quinn, tapping away at the armrest of the chair he had asked from the room of requirement. There were two places in Hogwarts where he was safe from the Basilisk, he was sitting in the first, and the second was the Icy Vault. Snakes didn't like cold, and Basilisk wasn't an exception, if Quinn became a squatter in the Icy Vault, he would be safe from the Basilisk as it would avoid the cold climate of the vault. Even Voldemort won't be able to command the Basilisk to go in there. I do not know who is the pitiful victim of the diary Horcrux. That itself is a problem, contemplated Quinn. 
If Ginny Weasley was the Horcrux host, he would have robbed the diary from her and chucked it into the room of lost things. But, there was a part of Quinn's mind that didn't worry about the Basilisk, and it was because of his blood status. Quinn came from a pure blood family, and the young Tom Riddle was obsessed with his Slytherin lineage. Slytherin didn't want students of non-magical or mixed lineage to enter Hogwarts, and the young Tom Riddle followed that mindset with his heart. He wanted to rid Hogwarts of first-generation magicals, Muggleborns. All his victims were Muggleborns, except Penelope Clearwater, who was collateral damage, an unplanned victim. Quinn was a pure blood wizard, so there was a part of Quinn's mind that thought he was safe. That the controlled Basilisk won't target him. The one time in his life that his blood status would help him out. His being pure blood would help him out in this situation. He didn't believe in pure blood propaganda. Why would he? It didn't help him in magic. His hard work was what helped him progress in his magic capabilities. Blood purity had nothing to do with it. But now, here he sat, wondering if this blood purity would save him from mortal danger. An archaic way of thinking that led to genetic abnormalities, gene pole degradation, the possibility of declination of magic, and the birth of squibs. He didn't like this fact at all. It didn't fit well with him that this inherently corrupt doctrine might possibly help him out. Quinn just sat there in his chair, staring at the floor, lost in thought about the time to come. Scene break. Mr. Viridian, how are you today? Having a quiet day, I hope, said Quinn as he put on a pair of gloves over his head. Portrait Vindita stared down at Quinn but didn't open his mouth to utter a single sound in greeting. Quinn waited for some chat back, but as every day, the portrait didn't entertain him, so he moved on, all right, please open up, I have to go inside. Password, demanded Portrait Vindita's. Quinn exhaled a sigh and put his hands on his waist before asking, you know if you didn't ask me for a password every day, we would have been good friends. Password. Quinn clicked his tongue and spoke, Imerte lies. The door opened up without a single word of response, and Quinn stepped but not before saying, see you in a bit, Mr. Viridian. The inside of the room of rewards was dull as ever, with black binders resting on shelves. Orbs of light manifested around Quinn, providing proper lighting for him to navigate and read. Okay, time for another session of reading random people's school records, said Quinn. He started from where he left off yesterday, like a damn blue-collar worker. Quinn sat down his butt down on the floor and began reading, and while he read, a small holographic image of the binder appeared in front of him in midair. The holographic binder opened up, and it was the exact copy of the binder in Quinn's hands. When he looked at a parchment, a holographic image of parchment would appear in the holographic binder. If you looked closely at the holographic parchment, you would see words appear on it. If you backed up and looked at Quinn and the binder on his hand, you would notice that the words on the holographic parchment were the same as Quinn was reading. As Quinn read, the words were appearing on the holographic image on the parchment. Quinn didn't want to waste his time just reading, so he devised a practice exercise to utilize his time. The practice was to get better at illusion magic. An illusion was a distortion of the senses, revealing how the mind usually organizes and interprets sensory stimulation. By disrupting and manipulating the sensory input to the brain, a magical could their perception of reality. Currently, Quinn was casting illusion magic on himself. He was disrupting his own senses to make himself feel the illusions. It was the best way to practice illusion magic. If he understood how his mind interpreted sensory input, then he would have an understanding of every single mind out there. There were six base sensory perceptions, sight, visual, smell, olfactory, touch, tactile, hearing, auditory, taste, gustatory, and magic, extrasensory. Currently, he was working on the visual sense or the perception of sight, he was working on how the eye interpreted light and was deceiving his own eyes to believe that there is a holograph of the binder he was reading. By using the binder, he was changing the illusion with every second by adding words to parchments. It was great practice by creating dynamic illusions. The only limitation to illusion magic was the imagination and understanding of the caster. If you wanted to cast an illusion of fire, you needed to know the physical characteristics of fire. How the wisps of fire moved, the heat of the fire, the color, the light projected by fire, and everything that would make the fire illusion believable. Illusions worked the best when the target believed that the illusion was real. It made the casters work easier because the target was digging themselves a hole, and all the caster was to give them a push. In the quiet room, the only sound was the turning of the pages. Quinn continued to read the student binders, sitting on the floor, and binders would float into his hands, and the ones he read would return to their places on the shelves. After two dozen binders, Quinn stood up from his spot on the floor to stretch his body. He walked to the shelf of the binder he was holding in his hand. He arrived at the section of the Room of Rewards that held the records of students from the time Hogwarts was under a century old. Both the shelves and the binders were old despite the preservation's charms cast on them. With a sigh, Quinn looked for the empty slot in the shelf to put the binder back. Ah, there is it, said Quinn, walking to the empty and was about to put the binder back when he noticed something weird. There was some kind of engraving on the shelf wood that was visible because there wasn't a binder covering it. He hadn't noticed it before because he used magic to draw the binders to his spot on the floor. Quinn put the binder back into its place and stepped back. With a twitch of his magic, the entire row of binders floated out of the shelf and glided overhead. The dust on the empty shelf cleared, and small orbs of light appeared to shed some light on the rack. Quinn moved closer to get a better look and saw that the entire plank of wood was engraved. 
He thought of something and saw that the roof of the rack, too, was embossed with symbols. All right, responded Quinn and memorized the symbols on the plank before putting the binders back into the rack. He concentrated on the entire multi-row shelf and pulled out all the binders from top to bottom. And, lo and behold, the entire bookshelf was engraved with symbols. He laughed in discovery, now, we are talking. Quinn looked left to right and saw that the designs of the shelves in this section were identical. He had ignored the fact because he didn't think it was relevant, but now it gave him a starting point. He ran to one corner of the section of shelves and pulled out entire rows of binders to memorize the symbols on the wooden planks. Repeating the process on every row of binders and every rack in the section. It took some before Quinn had managed to memorize every single rectangle of symbols. These aren't from a traditional language, noted Quinn, while he paced up and down the room, thinking about the symbols he saw. He suddenly stopped and blurted, they weren't complete. He looked around the room and decided that it was time to leave the room for today. I need to work on this, spoke Quinn. A toothy grin reared on his face, threatening to split his face. He had been reading the boring binders for closer to two months now. He knew about people's test scores who were dead centuries ago. Finding this clue was like an escape from his personal hell. Quinn hopped his way out of the room of reward and turned back to shoot finger guns at portrait venditas. See you later, Mr. Viridian. I will see you later. The stoic man in the portrait just stared at Quinn and began to think of a new password for tomorrow. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Omega, extra. Quinn, if an old man and a child come in front of your broom, what will you hit? Eddie, the old man. Quinn, idiot. You should hit the brake. Eddie. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, oh boy, here we go again. Ivy Potter, observer, yeah, her stock of Quinn is dropping really low. Eddie Carmichael, love sweet, not gonna lie, the first half didn't get him, but the second one did. Portrait Venditas Viridian, gatekeeper, one day, he would triumph over the smug brat. Chapter 53, Cipher, Decoding, and Descent The Room of Requirements has always provided its user with what they desired. Today, too, the person who called out to the room got what they sought from the magical room. On a very long table sat long strips of paper with symbols written on them in black ink. There were hundreds of these strips, each long strip of paper representing a plank of symbols that Quinn copied from the Room of Rewards. He arranged them in the order of time. The plank which held the oldest binders went first, followed by the planks which had binders that came after them. This arrangement was the one that made the most sense to Quinn because he did not know what the symbols meant. They weren't alphabets from any traditional language that Quinn knew. The symbols were made from figures with angles, triangles, with at most one dot per symbol. This is a cipher, was the conclusion that Quinn came up with. The symbols weren't random, and Quinn could see the pattern and repetition in the symbols. There are 25, 25, distinct symbols. One less than the English alphabet? Hmm. Is there a missing letter in the code, noted Quinn, his hand holding his chin in thought. Within a blink of his eyes, 25 symbols in red appeared in front of Quinn, floating in midair. These were all the unique symbols present in the cipher. Using illusions instead of writing the symbols down was redundant, as Quinn needed to maintain his magic while focusing on deciphering the cipher, but he did it for a reason. Last year, Quinn had noticed that he was spending too much time in the icy vault. He did nothing but try to get into the vault and spent a lot of time doing it. The time that could have been better managed by him to focus on other areas of magic. So to avoid that problem this year, Quinn had decided that while he focused on the vault, he was going to make sure not to let his other magical studies fall behind. Practicing illusion magic was just one example of Quinn making sure that he didn't spend all of his time on the vault. Quinn stared at the 25 symbols for a while before deciding the next step of action. All right, let's apply the usual substitution cipher techniques. He clapped his hand and rubbed them rapidly as he roamed his eyes over the multiple strips of paper and symbol. Quinn judged the cipher as a substitution cipher. A substitution cipher was a way to encrypt data by replacing the plain text with ciphertext. In Quinn's case, the ciphertext were symbols, but they could be anything from letters, numbers, arcane symbols, lines, and dots, or weird alien squiggles. For example, Caesar cipher was a way to encrypt information using substitution. The key to the Caesar cipher was to involve a simple shift to the alphabet. The following represents a Caesar cipher with a shift of three places. Plain text, abdifkijkumnapristuvuxis. Cipher text, zizabdifkijkumnapristuvu. In the above example, a was ciphered by shifting three places to the left and getting X so when you wanted to write in your ciphered text, you would write it as X. And, thus began long hours of rational and logical reasoning and study of cipher text. Quinn was not experienced with ciphers and was the first time he was working on something like this. It took days over days of grind to work on the ciphered text that might give him the vault's location. While working on the cipher text, Quinn learned a lot about substitution ciphers and how to decode slash decipher this type of cipher. There were techniques, tips, and methods that went into decoding substitution ciphers. The first step to solving a substitution cipher was to look for single-letter words because they were almost definitely a or i. By having a guess on the singular-lettered words, Quinn could have a solid estimate on two letters. Another technique was to count the frequency of the cipher symbols that appeared in the text. In the English language, or more specifically, an English text, some letters appeared more than others. According to the statistics, 
E T A O I N S H R D L U were the most appearing letters, with E appearing the most and the frequency decreasing as we moved on to the right. A technique that might have worked was to look for apostrophes as T, D, M, L, L, or re typically followed them. But, there were no apostrophes in the text, so that went out of the window. This did make Quinn realize contractions like can't were written in their expanded form of cannot. From here on out, things got tough as Quinn had to search for repeating letter patterns. They were common repeating letter groups such as th, sh, re, ch, tr, ing, ion, and ent. With time, he started on trying to decipher two dash, three dash, and four letter words. Two letter words almost always had one vowel and one consonant. The five most common two letter words, in order of frequency, were of, to, in, is, and it. The five most common three letter words, in order of frequency, were the, and, for, was, and his. The most common four letter word was that. An encrypted term with the pattern hashtag underscore underscore hashtag was likely to be that. However, the pattern hashtag underscore underscore hashtag also represented 30 other words, so Quinn had a lot of combinations to work on. Quinn also scanned for double letters. They're most likely to be LL, followed in frequency by E, S, S, O, O, and T, T. Decrypting a cipher with hand took time, but slowly and surely, Quinn began making increasingly accurate guesses. Typical word fragments start to reveal themselves, though Quinn had to start over quite a few times because he guessed wrong. Scene break. Quinn sat in the history of magic class, his head resting on his palm. Professor Cuthbert Binns droned about various goblin rebellions and giant wars to board, sleeping students. The ghost's lessons were regarded as some of the most boring at Hogwarts, leading many students to not paying attention in his classes. The reason Quinn didn't listen in Binns' lecture was that the ghost spoke in straight facts. Those facts were all stated in the books, and Quinn felt that reading the Hogwarts text was sufficient for the history of magic classroom. Plus, Quinn knew more about the history of magic because he had read about said history from the perspective of various communities. He was playing with his pen, his mind lost in thought about the cipher. He had hit a bit of a snag with his decoding of the cipher text. There were only 25, 25, symbols in the cipher, but Quinn's initial assumption that the plain text was in English, and there were 26, 26, letters in the English alphabet. Quinn knew the plain text was in English because he had been getting solid results in the form of proper words and coherent sentences, but there sizable gaps in the text where Quinn couldn't make sense of the terms. The legible parts and paragraphs didn't help Quinn to the vault's location or its content. From what Quinn had deciphered, the text was religious sermons from a group known as the Order of Solomon's Temple. He felt a shake from his side and snapped out of his thought to look at the side, yeah, what is it? He asked, looking at Marcus, who sat to his right side. You should seriously join Muggle Studies. Professor Potter is genuinely fun. Her class is on its way to becoming my favorite, whispered Marcus. If you ask Professor Flitwick, he might allow you to add another subject to your schedule. I am not joining. I already all too much on my plate, Quinn whispered back. He had no interest in joining the Muggle Studies, no matter how fun Lily Potter's classes were. Really. He smiled and continued, let me tell you something fun that Professor Potter told us in her class today. Maybe that will motivate you to join the class. Quinn gave him a go on, chin jut, and Marcus began. Did you know scribes used interchangeably I and J to express the sound of both the vowel and the consonant? It wasn't until 1524 when Gian Giorgio Trisino, an Italian Renaissance grammarian known as the father of the letter J distinguished between the two sounds by creating the letter J. Quinn's eye almost popped out from their sockets when he heard the juicy piece of information from Marcus's mouth. J didn't exist, he thought. Holy shit, this makes so much sense. There were only 25 before J of course, now it all fits together. Quinn stilled for a second before another thought occurred to him. He looked at his hands and thought, maybe I have plot armor, because this timing was definitely plot armor, ha, plot armor dot. He turned to Marcus and hugged the dude, Belby, you magnificent ball of sunshine. If you have any problem, come to me. I will fix it for you free of cost. Next time someone calls you something mean, holler me, and I will beat the crap out of them. Okay, responded Marcus. He felt weirded out because he saw Quinn's eyes pop out before he looked at his hands and chuckled strangely. Not to mention he wasn't expecting the hug from Quinn. He untangled himself from Quinn before beaming, then will you join muggle studies? Huh, no way. Why would I do that, said Quinn, as he swung his legs under the desk. How about you join care of magical creature? Marcus made a face, you, no way. Those creatures are gross. Yeah, but it is fun when you get to look at others squeak in fear or groan when touching something that you eloquently called as gross, laughed Quinn. Yeah, that is always so much fun. Dot. You are weird, was Marcus to the point reaction. Scene break. After Marcus told Quinn that Jay didn't exist before, Quinn ran to the room of requirements and entered the room. Inside, he unpacked a regular sized version of the entire cipher text and applied J and I to the text, and finally, he had the full deciphered text that Quinn thought was the correct interpretation. Yes, let's do this, said Quinn, and red English lettering floated from the paper. Illusion Magic did its job as the English plain text of the cipher text floated just above the page. The deciphered full text was from the Order of Solomon's Temple's sermons about religion, and just as he expected, there was nothing about the vault in the text. 
He pounded on the table and yelled, What in the world is this? Are you telling me that all of this was for nothing? The illusion of the deciphered text flickered away because of the bout of anger. Quinn angrily paced in the room before stomping his way to the table with the text. No, there must be something in here. I just have to look closer. Taking a deep breath, Quinn focused all his attention on the deciphered cipher that reappeared as an illusion. His eyes roamed all over the English text, looking for anything that would stand out. Maybe, there is something hidden in here, mumbled Quinn. He hunched over the table, and with his hands supporting his body, he concentrated, and seemingly random words turned from red to blue. The blue words would string together to form sentences before going back, and another set of words would turn blue and form another sentence. The process repeated repeatedly, the speed of formation of blue sentences sped up, and the words flashed faster with Quinn's pupils moving over every word. Then there was a sharp intake of air before Quinn stood straight as another set of blue words floated above the red words before the red words disappeared like sand in the wind, leaving behind a string of blue words. Under the seal, the antechamber of sin would be revealed. The first words of the lines in the Fibonacci sequence, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 1, under, 2, the, 3, seal, 5, the, 8, antechamber, 13, of, 21, sin, 34, would, 55, b, 89, revealed. I know what to do, said Quinn. His stone gray eyes glowed as he stared at those words. Quinn immediately moved. He wanted to see the results of his work. Scene break. Quinn walked to the portrait Vindita's and looked at the man in the painting. Vindita's Viridian stared at Quinn from his painting and noticed the smug child was here again. Password, he asked like he usually did. Insolubili Muro, came the immediate reply. The immediate answer surprised the portrait and, finally, noticed that the child wasn't smiling his smug smirk. Today, the child was serious. A determined and focused look on his face as he stared forward. Portrait Vindita's opened the door to the room of reward, and the child marched inside, not giving him a second look. Inside the room of rewards, Quinn walked straight to the center of the room. This is the seal, isn't it? Quinn said as he squatted on the floor and touched the Hogwarts seal on the floor of the room of rewards. An H in the middle with a lion, badger, eagle, and snake around it. Quinn traced his finger on the motto of the school. Draco Dormiens nunquam titillandas. Never tickle a sleeping dragon, he muttered before pumping magic into the seal. When Quinn had first checked the room, he had investigated the entire room for any extrinsic charms or wards, but nothing popped out, which meant that either there was nothing in the room, or the charms and wards were hidden beyond Quinn's capabilities. Now, if he had deciphered the ciphertext correctly and was right about the Fibonacci sequence, then the seal should react to his magic. Quinn could feel his magic being absorbed into the Hogwarts seal, but there was nothing triggered. His eyes caught the Hogwarts motto and took a chance. Aperio. It was Latin for open, reveal, uncover, and in this case, unseal. There was a slight rumble as Quinn noticed that every word on the seal changed into the cipher symbols, showing that he was correct about his interpretation of the cipher. The faint rumble stopped, and the circular seal disappeared into thin air, leaving behind a dark opening on the floor. Huh, no chilling cold. Always a good sign, spoke Quinn as he stared inside the pitch black darkness. He raised his hand over the opening as an orb of light appeared in his hand. Quinn uncurled his hand and let the orb of light fall into the opening. He craned his neck and watched as the light illuminated a long circular tunnel going deep below the room. The orb finally contacted the ground, and Quinn judged it was around 20 feet deep. All right, that is pretty doable, nodded Quinn as he stood up and looked near the entrance for a metallic disc to conjure into existence. The metal disc moved to the top of the opening before Quinn stepped onto the disc. Beginning descent, Quinn spoke to himself. The disc started to sink with Quinn standing upon it. He took a deep breath when his body sank into the opening, and he could no longer see the shelves. Slowly, the disc traveled down, Quinn making sure that there was no incident on his way down. Finally, Quinn exited the tunnel and was inside the antechamber, or as he thought, the vault. He didn't step down from the disc and focused his magic, and instantly twenty-something white orbs of light illuminated into life. He waved his hand, sending them in every direction. The orbs reached the ends of the room, revealing a sizable room, the same size as that of an average Hogwarts classroom, which could comfortably hold 40-50 people with plenty of space for every occupant. The problem was that the room was bare. There was nothing in the room, and the floor, ceiling, and walls were also plain with nothing to look at. Did someone already cleared out this one, was Quinn's thought. Maybe someone found this vault without getting to know about it from the ghosts. Quinn sighed as he stepped down from the disc as it disappeared behind him. He walked around the room, his fingers gliding over the smooth walls. Quinn sent his magic into the walls, but nothing happened. The walls didn't absorb his magic or show any changes. Man, this one is really weird. Maybe I should go ask Friar for another CL- Thud. In the plain room, Quinn collapsed without any warning. With him fainting, the orbs of light around the room extinguished, plunging the room into darkness. The opening tunnel was the only source of faint light. For a moment, there was no movement in the antechamber. Then the smooth walls of the heptagonal antechamber transformed to show seven rune circles, one on each wall. Each one glowed in a different light, violet, green, orange, blue, yellow, pink, and red. 
The centers of the seven individual runic circles brightly glowed before they shot seven sharp beams towards Quinn, covering his body in a harsh array of mixed light. The process was swift, with the beams only appearing for less than a minute before everything in the room returned to normal, leaving behind the unconscious body of Quinn West. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I am the author's little b asterisk tch. He can fk me over and I can't do anything about it. Fiction only reader, author, damn right he can't do anything. Marcus Belbley, Vessel, one time, the plot armor worked through him. Chapter 54, Unknown, and Commentary The feeling of the side of his face squished against the cold and dusty floor was not the feeling you wanted when waking up, but it was the one that Quinn felt when he groggily opened his eyes. He coughed, dislocating the dust and at the same time inhaling said dust into his mouth. Quinn immediately sat up but felt a dizzy spell hit him. His ears rang with a continuous buzzing, and the world around him was unstable and out of focus. The thought of conjuring a mouthful of water to clean his mouth was out of his mind as he struggled to properly assess his situation. The ringing in his ears and the blurry vision didn't help as Quinn tried to stand up, almost falling back to the floor in his effort. When he stood up, Quinn wavered to his sides, like a drunk with alcohol impairing his balance. Quinn grabbed his head because a headache assaulted him, making the ringing in his ears much more annoying. All the volatility in his body finally caught up to Quinn, and he stumbled forward, falling to the ground, his hands and forearms supporting his body from making complete contact with the floor. He cried out a mighty groan of pain as he turned to lay down on his back. Coincidentally, all his wobbling trying to walk caused him to fall just under the tunnel to this room, the sole source of dim light that fell from the room of rewards above. Under the circle of light, Quinn's chest moved up and down as he stared at the light. Slowly, his mental faculties returned to him, the ringing in his ears subsided, and the world returned to focus. The fading headache finally allowed Quinn to think where he was. The second vault, croaked Quinn, his voice cracking because of a dried out throat. Quinn couldn't recall anything about how he had fallen unconscious. All he could remember was walking in the room, and then he woke up with a nasty case of disorientation. The time between was just like sleep. I was so careful this time, thought Quinn, he hadn't taken any hasty steps while exploring the vault. He didn't even dare to step off the metal disc before he was sure that there was no trap in the chamber. But, it still happened, damn it, it still happened. Quinn laughed derisively. His light chuckles amplified in the quiet room before falling back into the consuming silence. Closing his eyes, Quinn decided to check the condition of his body. Several healing-grade diagnostic charms flowed through his body, giving back their result to Quinn. He couldn't find anything wrong with his body except a concussion. He guessed he hit his head on the floor on his fall. Nothing Madame Pomfrey can't fix, groaned Quinn. What time is it? Quinn took out his pocket watch from his robes and saw that there was only an hour before the curfew. He never stayed in the room of rewards after curfew because Portrait Venditus was an ex-headmaster, and Quinn didn't want the portrait to snitch on him being out after curfew. Quinn sat up from his laying position and sighed, time to get out of here. He pulled himself up to his feet and looked behind him at the dark vault chamber before raising both his hands to shoot out cords of light of the Cezan pool spell. A cord each shot out of Quinn's hands and attached themselves to the tunnel near its entrance. With a sigh, the spell pulled him up the tunnel. When he got out, Quinn saw the Hogwarts seal reappear on the place, hiding the tunnel, returning the room to its usual appearance, leaving no clue that there was a tunnel underneath the floor. Quinn vanished the dust on his clothes and walked to the exit. He pushed the door open and stepped out to nod a greeting towards Portrait Venditas, but said nothing and directly left. He made his way to the hospital wing, walking carefully as he still didn't have complete control over his coordination and felt a little nauseous. Madame Pomfret, called out Quinn, plopping his butt down on one of the chairs, rubbing his temple to alleviate the headache that had returned. The matron turned towards the voice to see Quinn sitting in a chair and was about to turn him away because it was already late, but then she saw the pale look on Quinn, with him showing a pained expression. She switched to her healer mode and hurried to the patient, what happened to you? She pulled out her wand and started to cast spells on Quinn, getting a full diagnostics. I think it is a concussion, responded Quinn. He said nothing else as Poppy Pomfrey was a professional, and he didn't need to tell about the spells he cast on himself. She just cast more spells than I cast, so she probably already knows. The matron finally stated her diagnostic results, you have a concussion, and your magic core is surprisingly drained. What were you doing? She walked away, and when she came back, she had a potion vial in her hand. Down this, ordered the matron, putting the vial in Quinn's face. He took it without a complaint and gulped the awful tasting potion in a single gulp. Yuck, said Quinn, sticking out his tongue in disgust. Don't be a baby, chided the medi-healer. How are you feeling? Quinn exhaled a heavy sigh as he felt the potion doing its work. He already felt so much better. It is working. He looked up at Madame Pomfret and saw the question in her eyes. I overpracticed and fainted on the floor. It surprised Quinn when Pomfret told him about the depleted magical core. He hadn't checked on his magical core when he was in the vault chamber. I didn't use much magic inside the vault. What the hell inside happened while I was out, wondered Quinn. At least the last time he knew what happened, but this time he had no idea what took place. Pomfra sighed before offering, do you want to sleep here today? Quinn shook his head and rejected the kind offer, no, it is alright. I would like to sleep in my own bed. He had no problem sleeping in the hospital wing, but this year, 
Quinn felt more comfortable inside the dorm because of the basilisk. She stared at Quinn for a moment before saying, All right, but come back here if you feel off about something. Quinn put his hands on his knees, propping himself up. The exhaustion was finally settling in. I will, thank you, Madame Pomfrey. Poppy Pomfrey saw of Quinn, looking at the tired back of the boy who was usually full of energy. Scene break. The first thing Quinn did when he reached his dormitory room was to take a warm shower. He stayed under the shower tiredly thinking about the events today. Unlike the last vault, this vault was a complete mystery. There was nothing of note in the underground chamber. Or, there is something in that vault, but it is beyond my level. Something had happened to Quinn inside that vault, which meant there definitely was something inside that vault. His sudden unconsciousness and depleted magical core were solid proof of a type of magic in there. Quinn got out of the shower, deep in thought. The next course of action was different. I need to visit the vault chamber once again tomorrow, decided Quinn. As soon as Quinn decided to visit the second vault, a momentary flash of soft blue light illuminated a spot on Quinn's nape. The moment the blue appeared on his nape, his eyes blurred for a split second before Quinn spoke. Maybe, I will go sometime later. I don't have to hurry about the vault. Yes, that sounds great. Slow and steady wins the race. He yawned and looked towards his bed, I am exhausted. Oh the bed looks really comfortable. I should go to sleep. He walked towards his bed and laid down on it. Yeah, this feels great. Dot. He curled up and made himself comfortable. With a smile on his face, he closed his eyes and sunk into a pleasant sleep. Another blue flash flickered on Quinn's nape before it faded away, leaving behind a sleeping Quinn. Scene break. The entire school gathered on the Quidditch pitch at 11 o'clock on a Saturday. A game was scheduled between Gryffindor and Slytherin. Quidditch in Hogwarts was a big deal, with almost all of the student population gathering in the stands to watch the game. The games were such a big deal that the stadium had seats for outsiders to watch the game. Plus, this game was between Gryffindor and Slytherin, the most bitter rivalry in the history of Hogwarts. Quinn sat in the commentator's seat, a smile gracing his face. Flitwick had asked him to volunteer for the commentator's job, and he had readily accepted the request without even thinking about it. He turned to look at McGonagall and asked, Can I start? McGonagall looked at her wristwatch and then looked at the stadium seats and nodded, Yes, the majority of the seats are filled. I think it is all right to start. Quinn grinned and turned to the microphone and turned it on. Ahem, my check. Pop pop popsicles, ice ice icicles, test test testing, one, two, three, ba dum tss. Quinn watched as his words turned heads all over the stands, and he grinned, all right, I can see many heads turning, which means the microphone is working. We are live. He turned to face McGonagall and waggled his eyebrows. The transfiguration professor just stared at Quinn, but her stern expression spoke loudly. Quinn turned back to the microphone and started. Good morning, Hogwitz. He grabbed the microphone and continued. Welcome to Hogwitz Quidditch. I am Quinn West and will be your commentator for the exciting game today. Before we start, this commentary was brought to you by the A.I.D consultation service. Are you a Hogwarts student? Are you facing a problem? Come to our office on the fifth floor, and we will sort you out. A.I.D is always happy and ready to help. He could feel McGonagall's eyes boring into his eyes, but Quinn continued nevertheless. Quinn looked up at the sky and commented. Today seems to be a muggy sort of day with a hint of thunder in the sky, so there are chances it might rain during the game. Rainy day games aren't good because of low visibility. Let's hope that it doesn't rain. He took the chance to give a shout out, my good friend Luna Lovegood hung Japanese Terra Terubozo dolls that are believed to ward off rain. The game today is an exciting one, one with the long-standing rivalry between the houses of Gryffindor and Slytherin. The two houses have pitted against each other on the field of Quidditch for centuries, vying for supremacy in the sport beloved by all of Hogwarts. The two teams entered the pitch, and Quinn veered the attention towards the players. The two teams have entered the pitch, Slytherin in green and Gryffindor in red. Both teams look like they are rearing to start the game. This game is going to be an exciting one with the Slytherin team riding on Nimbus 2001, the fastest professional brooms on the market. The seven players each have a Nimbus 2001, courtesy of Lucius Malfoy, but we can all say that it would have been better if he donated that money to upgrade the brooms that students use in flying classes. I am sure Madame Hooch would have been glad to work with some updated equipment, and Madame Pomfrey wouldn't have to grimace every time she looks at the brooms the students currently use. Believe me, it horrifies her that students ride on those arcane brooms. There were a lot of eyes from the stands. Old brooms didn't inspire motivation in anyone. All right, Slytherin is led by their captain Marcus Flint. This year, they have the new seeker, the second year, Draco Malfoy. I won't say that this came to me as a surprise. If you know what I mean. Of course, you all know what I mean. Quinn stared at the Slytherin team and remarked, Hmm, an all-male team, huh? Well, that is boring. Let's move on. A pink light flashed on Quinn's nape as he grinned. Let's move on to the Gryffindor team. Now, the Gryffindor team is much more interesting. We have the three chasers, Alicia Spinett, Angelina Johnson, and Katie Bell. Now, this, this is something we can work with. Mr. West. McGonagall's shout transmitted into the stands. All right, all right, can I get a heck yeah from the crowd? And Quinn did get a chant of heck yeah. A lot of boys yelled out their heck yeahs quite freely, appreciating Quinn's effort. 
Moving on, Greyfinder Captain Oliver Wood leads the team with tenacity and hard work. Sources say that he is a ferocious slave driver that lives for Quidditch. I have also heard that he has Professor McGonagall's permission and approval to be rough with the teammates. The back of Quinn's neck shone red as he proceeded, I guess Professor McGonagall's last game as a Gryffindor student against Slytherin in which she crashed and burned into the stands, still haunts her dream. I would pay serious money for that memory, ouch, who shot me with a pinching hacks. Laughter boomed across the stands, with Quinn's commentary entertaining everybody. Quinn rubbed his bum while glaring at McGonagall before returning to the microphone, next, we have the twins. The Weasley twins rank number one on the Hogwarts twins rankings. I personally like the Poddle twins more because they are really diametrically opposite to each other. Returning to the Weasley twins, they have the best coordination as a beater duo, but at the same time, they also have the highest number of fouls of sending the bludger into the stands. So everyone, please look out for stray bludgers coming out for your heads. Finally, we have the Gryffindor seeker, Harry Potter. The second, or maybe the third most famous Potter in the castle. It depends on who you ask, but all of us know that Professor Potter is the number Potter in the castle, said Quinn while a pink light flashed on his nape. Now, Harry Potter rides a Nimbus 2000, which is the predecessor to the Slytherin House's Nimbus 2001. The key difference between 2000 and 2001 is the top speed, 2001 outspeeds 2000 by a tiny margin. But other than that, both versions have the same top acceleration, handling, turning radius, and braking capabilities. But, top speed can be a crucial factor for professional level players, but here, versions 2000 and 2001 wouldn't be distinguishable on a performance basis. He looked at the Slytherin team and commented, but, all seven members of the Slytherin team equipped Nimbus 2001 will give them a great advantage. A yellow light flashed on Quinn's nape as he continued, damn, I should have opened a betting tab for the game. The money I could have earned. Maybe, next time. Mr. West, betting has no place in the honorable sport of Quidditch, berated McGonagall from his back. How about if I give good odds to the professors? How much are you talking dash? I mean, no, it is not allowed. All right, you know where to find me if you want to get in on the action. The game was about to start as Madame Hooch descended on the pitch on her broom, and the two teams lined in front of each other. A roar of cheers overflowed the stadium. Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff were anxious to see Slytherin beaten, but the Slytherins in the crowd made their boos and hisses heard, too. Madame Hooch, the Quidditch teacher, asked Flint and Wood to shake hands, which they did, giving each other threatening stares and gripping rather harder than was necessary. The game began when the 14 players and one referee rose up the leaden sky. Quinn also started his in-game commentary. Harry Potter has taken the high sky, higher than the rest of the other players, a standard strategy for snitch hunting. At that very moment, a heavy black bludger came pelting toward Harry, who avoided it with a very slim margin. The crowd sucked in their breaths at the close call. Oh boy, that was a close call. That bulger was about to give Potter an intense love hug. George Weasley streaks towards the bludger, but what is this? The bludger avoids him and once again rushes towards Potter. Oh, what a close call, that bludger almost took out Potter's head. Seeing, this Quinn thought that Dobby was also part of this timeline as the rogue bludger that was continuously targeting Harry Potter was charmed by Dobby to do so. But, while Quinn was in deep thought, a blue light appeared on his nape, and suddenly Quinn dropped his line of thought about Dobby. I will think about Dobby later. This game is much more fun than thinking about Dobby. Looks like the Gryffindor team has called a timeout. Maybe it is to discuss the bludger that is particularly matey towards their seeker. Quinn continued to diligently provide commentary. Quinn looked at the sky and spoke, looks like the weather is not on our side. It has started to rain. Please, make sure to cover yourself to avoid getting wet and risk catching a cold. The Gryffindor team ended their timeout without stopping the match to check out the bludger and continued the game in the increasingly pouring rain. And, the moment the game continued, the bludger whistled towards Harry Potter like a homing missile. Harry flew expertly, avoiding the bludger narrowly every time. Finally, Harry had spotted the golden snitch, but while he caught it, the bludger rammed into his shoulder hard. Quinn winced, thinking about the shattered bones. Oh boy, that will surely hurt a lot later. Wait. Harry Potter has caught the snitch. The golden seeker has caught the golden snitch. The game is over. Gryffindor, against the clear equipment deficit, has defeated Slytherin and has clinched the victory from their mouths. Oliver Wood and his team have done it. Gryffindor is victorious. Another flash of blue graced his nape, and Quinn lost all his energy. He sat down on his seat and felt a little tired from all the talking he did. This was more tiring than I thought, said Quinn, not knowing that something was happening to him. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, pink, red, yellow, dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, something is wrong with him. McGonagall, Quidditch junkie, avid Gryffindor supporter. Harry Potter, seeker, busted arm, Lockhart still vanishes his arm. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Web novel has been shadow banning comments recently. This means that any comment that contains profanities in any form will be automatically deleted. So, if you are commenting with curses and profanities, censor a single letter or get creative. Chapter 55, Engraving Tool, and Dueling Club Quinn stood in his workshop, working on a new piece of equipment. 
He had worked hard to get this piece of equipment and had kind of risked his life while obtaining it. In front of him sat a thin black rectangular case on a table in his workshop. He gazed at the black case, and it unlocked with a click. The case's lid rose up and moved aside, revealing behind a thin golden cylinder with a 4 mm, 4 mm, diameter and a length of 12 cm, 12 cm. The thin golden cylinder was the same cylinder that super chilled using the cold energy from absolute zero. Quinn didn't touch the box or the gold cylinder because they were intensely cold. He glanced at the spot on the table beyond the black case, and there sat a hexagonal metal cylinder with a conical tip on one end, in simpler words, it was in the shape of a pencil. The metallic pencil rose from the table and flew into Quinn's hand. The metallic pencil was made from vanadium and steel alloy. He moved the metallic pencil closer to his face and saw the faint runic markings all over the pencil's surface. He turned it to the non-conical side to reveal a cylindrical hole in the pencil. This was the place where the chilled gold cylinder was going to fit. The metallic pencil was a runic tool that used a super chilled magic conductor as its core to channel magic into the runes etched into the metal. The metallic pencil floated in his hand, and his other hand veered his hand towards the gold cylinder and used his magic to lift it off the case. Quinn could feel his magic react to the cold, and it was slightly more difficult to control, but to Quinn, it was nothing as he had operated his magic on a super chilled block of ice for months. The hexagonal metallic pencil and the gold cylindrical core lined with each other, and with a move of magic, the gold cylindrical core slipped inside the metallic pencil. The opening immediately closed when the gold cylinder was fully inserted into the metal. Quinn gently channeled magic into the metallic pencil, and immediately, all the runic markings on the surface glowed with white, and the tip of the metallic pencil also turned white. Excellent, grinned Quinn. The back of his nape shone in violet color. Quinn felt extremely proud of the magical tool floating over his hands. He genuinely thought that this was the best thing that came out of this room in the entire thousand-year history of Hogwarts. All right, let's go and test this out, Quinn spoke and cleared out the black case from the table and bought out a thin circular metal disc of the size of a coaster. Placing the thin metallic disc on the table, Quinn stuck it to the table with a sticking charm. Okay, testing the new concentrated magic engraving tool for shallow rune engraving, commented Quinn while he put on his leather apron, leather gloves, and safety goggles. Quinn's metallic pencil engraving tool floated above the metal disc, and with a thrum of Quinn's magic, the rune marking light up in white, and the tip shone brighter than any rune on the metal. The metal engraver lowered down to the metal disc, and the white tip contacted the metal. There was a trill as Quinn used magic to draw runes on the metal disc, carefully sliding the glowing tip over the disc to mark runes over the metal. The glow on the runes and tip changed as Quinn dynamically altered the flow of magic as per the requirement. It took a few minutes before the entire surface of the metal disc was marked with very shallow runes. The runes on the engraver dimmed as Quinn stopped supplying magic to the gold core inside the metal body. Quinn vanished the fumes created because of the engraving before pulling the engraver closer to him. He released the gold core from the body and observed its condition after a session of rune engraving. Hmm, at this rate, it will last for another, maybe 10 sessions before I need to recharge the cold energy from absolute zero, noted Quinn as he attentively examined the thin gold cylindrical core. The core floated to the side and took its place back inside the black case as Quinn moved towards the engraved metal disc. Shallow engravings of less than a millimeter, equals 0.9 mm, depth covered the entire metal surface. Oh yeah, now this is precision art, Quinn admired the runic marking engraved by the rune engraver. The results were as stunning as Quinn expected. Runes were all about the material used and the shape of the runes that were drawn. The more accurate the constructs, the better the runes would perform their tasks. Before today, Quinn had been using transmutation to engrave runes on solid surfaces like wood and metals, but there was a slight problem with that method, and it was precision. Quinn could successfully mark runes into the solids, but they were not the best engravings as Quinn struggled with dimensions. He couldn't make engravings that had a depth of less than 2 to 3 millimeters, 2 to 3 millimeters, with transmutation because that level of precision was out of his current mastery level. Some runes needed to be of depths less than that amount, and unless Quinn could improve his mastery, those runes would work, but not as effectively as Quinn wanted them to. But, with the rune engraver, Quinn could overcome the problem until he could improve his mastery over transmutation. He picked up the metal disc into a wooden frame and fitted a glass dome over the wooden frame to cover the metal disc. Quinn set everything in their place with sticking charms. Quinn looked up at the ceiling chandelier, and all the candles extinguished with a gust of wind. The room went dark with no light source. Light from the table bathed the room with white as Quinn's newly engraved metallic disc performed its function. It was a rune cluster that produced an orb of light above the metal disc, providing light like a standard light bulb. Quinn looked around and finally saw how everything in his workshop looked like in white light instead of the yellow light of the candles. Yeah, white light is better than yellow light. Much better, Quinn picked up the magical light bulb and moved around the room to shine a light on everything. Three more for the workshop and two for the office would be enough. He stared at the magical light bulb with a proud smile on his face. The violet on his nape bloomed and thrummed with activity. Scene break. Colin Creevy had been attacked and was now lying in the hospital wing as though dead. Such news had spread through the entire school. The air was suddenly thick with rumor and suspicion. The first years were now moving around the castle in tight-knit groups, as though scared they would be attacked if they ventured forth alone. 
Before, Mrs. Norris was petrified, so no one really cared about the event as the victim was a cat, but this time the victim was a student, and with the rumor mill, the teenage minds believed whatever was fed to them. And, amongst all this tension, the school announced an event that excited all students in Hogwarts. Quinn, Eddie, and Marcus stood in front of the notice board in front of the entrance hall. A small knot of people stood with them, who were similarly reading a piece of parchment pinned on the board. They're starting a dueling club, said Marcus. First meeting tonight? I wouldn't mind dueling lessons, they might come in handy one of these days. What, you reckon Slytherin's monster can duel, joked Eddie, but he, too, read the sign with interest. Could be useful, Quinn said to Eddie and Marcus as they walked to the Great Hall for dinner. At the very least, it would be fun. Let's drop by tonight. Eddie and Marcus were all for it. So, at nine o'clock that evening, three pals hurried back to the Great Hall. The long dining tables had vanished, and a circular stage had in the middle of the hall, lit by thousands of candles floating overhead. The ceiling was velvety black once more, and most of the school seemed to be packed beneath it, all carrying their wands and looking excited. It surprised Quinn to see a circular stage instead of the long straight one like in the series. I wonder who will be teaching us, said Marcus as they edged into the chattering crowd. It will be Flitwick, of course. He was a dueling champion, who better than him, replied Eddie. Quinn grinned as he nudged them to look at the stage. At least one of you is right, Quinn spoke, but it surprised him as well because Phileas Flitwick accompanied Gilderoy Lockhart instead of Snape in the canon Snape and Lockhart pairing. Lockhart waved an arm for silence and called, gather round, gather round, can everyone see me, can you all hear me, excellent, now, Professor Dumbledore has granted me permission to start this little dueling club, to train you all in case you ever need to defend yourselves as I myself have done on countless occasions for full details, see my published works, let me introduce my assistant, Professor Flitwick, said Lockhart, flashing a wide smile, he tells me he knows a tiny little bit about dueling himself and has sportingly agreed to help me with a short demonstration before we begin. Now, I don't want any of you, youngsters, to worry you'll still have your charms master when I'm through with him, never fear. Flitwick's lip was curled into an almost feral smile in response. Quinn cackled and repeatedly slapped Eddie on his shoulder, Lockhart is an idiot. Eddie and Marcus actually felt second-hand embarrassment because of Lockhart. Lockhart and Flitwick turned to face each other and bowed, at least, Lockhart did, with much twirling of his hands, whereas Flitwick simply nodded. Then they raised their wands like swords in front of them. As you see, we are holding our wands in the accepted combative position, Lockhart told the silent crowd. On the count of three, we will cast our first spells. Neither of us will aim to kill, of course. One, two, three dash. Both of them swung their wands above their heads and pointed them at their opponent, Flitwick cried, stupefy. There was a dazzling flash of scarlet light, and the next second, Lockhart crumpled into a heap on the floor. Quinn could see Malfoy and his gang of Slytherin cheered. Many girls gasped and squealed their fingers. Flitwick turned to look at the crowd of students and spoke, looks like Professor Lockhart would be out of commission for a while, so I will be taking over this lesson. Flitwick swung his wand, and Lockhart's clothes tugged upward and dragged him off the stage to a corner of the Great Hall. The charm I used was a stunning charm, as you saw, it stunned Professor Lockhart unconscious. Now, I think you saw sufficient demonstration. Does anyone like to volunteer? Flitwick turned around to look at the entire crowd and didn't see any hands rising. Maybe it was because they just saw Flitwick stun Lockhart or because no one wanted to go first. Quinn also looked around to see if anyone would volunteer when he felt his shoulders being grabbed. He looked to his sides to see Eddie and Marcus smiling, and then they pushed him forward. Whoa, you gormless little pieces of naffers, cursed Quinn as he stumbled to the front of the crowd. Flitwick's eyes shined as he excitedly clapped in bony hands, looks like Mr. West wants to take part, excellent, ten points to Ravenclaw, come on up. Quinn sighed before shaking his head with a smile. He removed his robes and turned back to throw them at Eddie, you two better not come up there because I will make your lives miserable glaring at his two friends as they stuck out their tongues at him. The crowd cheered when Quinn removed his robes and climbed up onto the stage while loosening his necktie. He raised his hand to the crowd with a chill smile on his face. Now, who will be the other one? Flitwick twirled around his spot. Students, don't be shy, and please step up. Quinn was absentmindedly playing with his fake wand when he heard the Slytherin cheer up. He turned in their direction to find a Slytherin student climb upstairs to the stage. Miles Bletchley, fourth year, Quinn tilted his head as he identified the Slytherin student Slytherin Quidditch team, a mean-spirited individual who lacked good sportsmanship. He takes enjoyment in mocking others and likes to play rough. Hmm, did he come up because he thinks he can win this fight? The red light took root on his nape as Quinn felt disrespected. He could see the slight smirk on Miles Bletchley's face, which made Quinn feel angry. Flitwick grinned in delight as he motioned his two participants to face each other. Face your partners, called Flitwick, back on the platform. And bow. Neither of the two duelers bowed to each other and just stared at the other. Bletchley smirked at Quinn, while Quinn didn't smile or anything and just stared back. One's at the ready, shouted Flitwick. When I count to three, cast your charms to disarm your opponents only to disarm them. We don't want any accidents. One, two, three, go. Quinn didn't bother raising his wand high and just stared at Bletchley. On the other hand, Bletchley moved immediately and cast a curse, and it was not the disarming charm. 
Fernunculus. The Fernunculus curse caused the target to erupt in painful boils slash pimples. If you had mastery over the curse, then the boils could be pretty painful and continuously ooze with puss. A gold flash of spell light zapped toward Quinn, who simply sidestepped to avoid the curse. Bletchley clicked his tongue and cast one more curse. Calvario, a dark curse that removed all hair from the curse's victim. Quinn ducked and let the spell pass him. All right, if this is how he wants to play, thought Quinn and walked towards Bletchley. Bletchley frowned and cursed another charm. Locomotor Mortis. A curse that is used to bind the legs of the victim together. Quinn hopped to let the curse hit the floor. Bletchley growled as he saw a mocking grin on Quinn's face. Stupefy. Bletchley roared in frustration. A jet of red coursed through the air aimed right at Quinn's face. Quinn tilted his head with a smirk, and the red jet whistled past him. Bletchley stood stunned at yet another dodge and was startled when he saw Quinn running towards him. He raised his wand and tried to cast a charm, but in his agitated state, he wasn't able to decide on a spell. Quinn stopped right in front of Bletchley, winked at his opponent, and snatched Bletchley's wand straight from his hand and chucked it over his head into the crowd. Ah, nice try. Those were some serious nasty curses, you know? If one of those hit me, that would have been bad. Quinn tapped Bletchley's face with the back of his hand. Better luck next time. The red glow on his nape turned violet as he turned his back to Bletchley and pumped his hand in the air. That's how you do it. The crowd, which was silent while watching the duel, erupted in cheers and applauses for Quinn. To watch a person dodging every spell and win without using magic in the manner Quinn did was exciting to see. Quinn put his fake wand on the side of his neck, and it amplified his voice for all to hear, All right, who is next? Let's get this party started. Flitwick, who was watching from the side, just beamed and walked off the stage. He was surprised that Quinn didn't cast a single spell, but he was amused by the effortless dodging. Looking at the crowd's mood, he decided it would be a waste to remove Quinn from the stage. No time was wasted as one of the Weasley twins stepped on the stage and the Gryffindor students cheered for him. Take the bird brain down. Gryffindor rules. Quinn spread his arms and smiled towards the Weasley twin, ah, before we start, which one are you? The Weasley laughed before speaking, I am Fred, or maybe I am George. Or, maybe I am Forge or neither of them and am Gred. Quinn nodded with a tilt and laughed, true, true, what is in a name? Let's start, shall we? Both nodded and readied their wands. From below the stage, Flitwick counted them off. One, two, three, go. This time Quinn moved first and swiftly took a step forward while kneeling down on one knee to shoot a conjured rope towards Fred slash George's legs. The sudden spell took the twin by surprise, and the rope wrapped around his legs, sealing any movement from his lower body and also messing up his balance. Quinn grinned and waved his wand. Suddenly, the rope around Fred slash George's legs rose up into the air with its captive in the toe. Whoa, shouted Fred slash George as he found himself being lifted into the air, upside down at that. Quinn let the Weasley hang in the air for a bit before levitating the rope so that Fred slash George moved towards the Gryffindor crowd and lowered him close to the ground before releasing the rope spell, letting Weasley fall onto the floor. Everyone, including a lot of Gryffindor students, cheered for Quinn at yet another win. The victor raised both his hands and prompting the crowd to cheer more loudly. Quinn laughed in delight as he bathed in the cheers. The violet on his nape deepened in color and turned vivid and dark. Inside his body, Quinn's magic sang with power and vibrated with activity. Quinn felt his magic's presence much clearer than ever before. He closed his eyes and felt his connection with his magic deepen in real time. The feeling was exhilarating, lifting his already good mood even better. This feels so good. The patch of violet on Quinn's nape had gained another level of depth as Quinn felt the change in his magic. Not for a second did the thought of why his magic was reacting the way it did, cross Quinn's mind. His mind was too distracted by the stimulation his magic was providing right now. Quinn's magic was changing. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, underscore 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 T underscore. Pink. Red, underscore 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 H. Yellow, underscore underscore E underscore underscore. Violet, underscore underscore I underscore E. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, having a good time. Phileas Flitwick, dual master, scoot over it is my time. Gildaroi Lockhart, Professor Dash, stunned unconscious. Chapter 56, Quinn vs Tracy, Parcel Tongue, and Gossip The change in his magic bought immense pleasure and delight to Quinn as he found his mood uplifted and a skip accompanying his step. Quinn looked around the crowd to see if anyone wanted to be his next opponent. And, his eyes met with those of Tracy. He smiled and beckoned his Slytherin friend with his hands. The gesture surprised the brunette Slytherin as she shook her head side to side, but Quinn relayed everything would be okay with his eyes, and it was okay to come up. Tracy hesitated if she wanted to go up to the stage, and after some thinking, decided to go up. She stepped forward and directly climbed the steps to the stage. There was a lot of booing from the other three houses because of Tracy's status as a Slytherin. The harsh booze affected Tracy, and she did her best not to show that it affected her. But if you looked closely, you could see the slight slump in her gait. Ignore the other, and let's have some fun, Tracy. It startled Tracy to hear Quinn's voice so close to her, it was like that he was directly whispering into her ear, but when she looked up, Quinn was standing a distance from her, showing a comforting smile, and when their eyes met, Quinn gave her a quick wink. You called me Tracy, she spoke in utter surprise. 
After an entire year of Mrs. Davis and Davis, she finally heard Quinn call her by her given name. Tracy's words made Quinn realize he had called the girl by her first name, and it was quite a surprise to himself as well. Tracy saw Quinn's lips move and once again heard his voice like he was standing right beside her. Yes, I did. It looks like I will be calling you by Tracy from now on. You are the first one, you know? The first one I called by their first name. Ha ha ha, be honored, little girl. Tracy's eyes sparkled with delight at being first, and she couldn't feel any negativity from the booze of the crowd. She took out her wand with confidence and aimed it at Quinn, following Quinn's lead. Remember, cast a disarming spell, Expelliarmus. Tracy nodded, hearing Quinn's explanation, directly delivered to her ears and no one else's. One, two, three, go. The second Flitwick yelled go, Tracy moved first and cast a disarming spell. Expelliarmus. An impulse of scarlet magic burst out of her wand and buzzed towards Quinn. Quinn also pointed his fake wand and whispered Expelliarmus in the likely event anyone was listening and countered with his own scarlet burst of spell light. The two spells made contact in between the two casters and cancelled each other out. Quinn grinned and again cast a disarming spell towards Tracy. Tracy, who now was feeling confident, and countered with her own disarming spell. The crowd oed and ied when they saw the two spells collided with each other. Once again, they cancelled each other, giving the crowd the show they wanted. Tracy was back in her element and showed her taking charge personality and shot a stream of disarming spell light which hurled towards Quinn. Now we are taking, laughed Quinn as he shot out a stream of the same spell towards Tracy's. The two red jets of magic met in the middle, colliding with each other, fighting for dominance. It entranced the younger students when they saw the continuous jets of magic meeting each other. Tracy held her wands with both her hands when she felt Quinn's magic overpowering her and tried to channel magic into her wand, trying to push back. But, the struggle was futile as Quinn's magic continued to overpower hers, and Quinn's spell light moved closer and closer to hers. The Slytherin students in the crowd cheered for their representative. Quinn had humiliated the last one, but she stood steadfast against Quinn, which was had redeemed the house of Slytherin. Quinn calmly smiled as he inserted a burst of magic into the spell and overpowered Tracy's magic in one fell swoop, forcing Tracy's hand open and driving her wand out it, disarming her in the process. The wand wheeled in the air before it landed in Quinn's hand, who caught it with a cheeky smile on his face. I won, he laughed, walking towards Tracy, handing her the wand back. Good duel. Tracy held her wand back in her hands and grinned her usual bubbly smile, good duel. Great, he smiled before turning to look at Flitwick and gestured that he was done for today. Flitwick picked up the gesture and climbed up to the stage while Quinn and Tracy took the other set of steps to get down. Tracy and Quinn parted their ways, and Tracy ran to Daphne and got looks of approval from many Slytherin students. Are you okay? asked Daphne, worried about her friend. He didn't overdo it, did he? Tracy swayed on her spot with her hands behind her back and grinned a boastful smile, he called me Tracy. Daphne tilted her head in confusion and asked, what? Quinn called me Tracy, she repeated, waiting for the news to sink in her friend's pretty head. What else would he call Dash? Daphne began speaking, but mid-sentence realization struck her, and she stopped. He called you Tracy. Tracy giggled and bumped Daphne's shoulder with hers. He said I was the first one he called by their first name. He he he. The blonde turned her blue eyes to look at the Ravenclaw in question and saw him putting his robes back on, laughing with his friends and housemates. She felt a hand on her shoulder and looked back to see Tracy gazing at her with an encouraging expression. Don't worry, he will call you by your given name soon. Daphne stared at her best friend and spoke in a flat voice, I couldn't care less. Tracy waggled her eyebrows, opting not to say anything, but gave a sure you do look to her best friend. Scene break. It was like someone pasted a permanent smile on Quinn's face causing him to beam like the happiest person in the world. He was experiencing something like a euphoric high. The change in his magic was becoming more pronounced to Quinn when he took a moment to feel it and could sense the enchanting feel of his magic under his control better than ever. He just wanted to let his magic loose and cast a massive freeze wave in the great hall or transfiguring the floor to change the terrain of the hall. Anything would do as long as it would allow him to flex his magical capabilities, but he held back and looked at the stage, watching the duels. His interest deepened when he saw Harry Potter climb up the stage with a swagger in his step and confidence in his gait. The boy who lived looked comfortable on the big stage and under the gaze of the majority of the student population. Harry walked near the Slytherin side and pointed at Draco, hooking his index finger to beckon his enemy slash rival to come up to the stage to duel him. You won't be a no-show like that last time, would you Malfoy? Because last year was an utter disappointment. Let's have the duel you so much wanted, said the boy who lived, speaking so that everyone could hear him. Draco's face heated up with anger as he growled, Pata. The blonde Malfoy stepped onto the stage, stepping up to face Harry Potter in a duel. Both second-year students faced each other on the circular stage and looked at each other with their chins raised slightly, not bothering to bow to each other. Flitwick looked side to side at Harry and Draco and didn't bother telling them to use disarming spells. From the looks the two gave each other, it didn't look like they would listen to him. The half-goblin wasn't actually worried about the spells the two would use against each other. If they got injured, that would only serve as a lesson to them that the spells were dangerous. One, two, three, go. Harry swung his wand high, but Malfoy had already started on two, his spell hit Harry so hard that Harry felt as though someone had hit him over the head with a saucepan. 
He stumbled, but everything still seemed to work, and wasting no more time, Harry pointed his wand straight at Malfoy and shouted, Rictusempra. A jet of silver light hit Malfoy in the stomach, and he doubled up, wheezing with laughter. Harry had hit him with a tickling charm, and he could barely move for laughing. Malfoy pointed his wand at Harry's knees, choked. Tarrant Legra. And the next second, Harry's legs jerked around out of his control in a kind of quick step. It was the spell that made a target's legs spasm wildly out of control, making it appear as though they were dancing. Harry was startled but cast a finite on his knees, stopping them from spasming. Draco, on the other side, did the same to make himself stop laughing. Below the stage, Quinn, with his arms crossed, observed the duel and thought, I would have obliterated both of them together multiple times by now. Serpent Sorsha bellowed Draco, and Quinn watched as the end of Draco's wand exploded with light as a long black snake shot out of it, fell heavily onto the floor between them, and raised itself, ready to strike. It is happening, thought Quinn, stepping a step forward while everybody stepped back in fear. Harry brandished his wand at the snake, and there was a loud bang, the snake was pushed back with force. Enraged, hissing furiously, it slithered straight toward Justin Finch Fletchley, who was standing a bit too close to the stage and raised itself again, fangs exposed, poised to strike. Quinn wasn't looking at the snake of Justin Finch Fletchley and trained his eyes on Harry Potter. Quinn's eyes opened a fraction when he saw Harry walk towards the snake. A green shade bloomed on Quinn's nape as he heard the boy who lived hiss as the snake and saw miraculously, inexplicably, the snake slumped to the floor, docile as a thick, black garden hose, its eyes now on Harry. Parcel tongue, the language of serpents, spoke Quinn, not knowing that everyone around him heard him. Quinn's words bought them out of their fear and set a fire of murmurs across the students. Everybody had one thought in their heads, is Harry Potter, the heir of Slytherin? Quinn didn't have thoughts like that. He just stared at Harry with an envious gaze. Harry Potter had a magical ability that he didn't have. The ability to communicate and command another species to a degree was always a plus point. It was an uncommon skill and was known to be an almost exclusively hereditary trait. Quinn was jealous that he did not have the ability to speak parcel tongue. Neither did he know if it was possible to learn parcel tongue. He had heard the lore that Dumbledore could speak it, but Quinn wasn't sure if it was true. He had been to India, and the parcel mouths there told him it was something you were born with. The green patch deepened with Quinn's emotions, planting its roots in Quinn, but it stopped when Quinn heard a screech from the snake that burned into the nothingness from a spell from Flitwick. The charms professor had lost the excited smile he had on his face and had an urgent look on his face and a suspicious look in his eyes as he looked at Harry. Suddenly, Ivy ran up to the stage and pulled on Harry's robes, dragging her twin off the stage. Ron Weasley shoved the students aside, making way for the golden squad so that they could leave the great hall and the suspicious eyes that bore into the back of Harry. Scene break. Quinn groaned as he woke up in the morning and sat in his bed. He didn't want to get up from his bed and contemplated skipping his morning run. Yesterday, he had gotten excited about his new magical improvement and had run an obstacle course full of moving targets and dummies placed around an irregular terrain. He had run laps around the course while shooting magic heavy spells while running, jumping, and doing all kinds of physical exertion. He rolled in his bed for a while before noticing something. The sleepy boy looked towards his legs and felt something peculiar. He lifted his sheet to what was inside. There was a tent standing in his pant. Quinn watched it with an intrigued look on his face. Hmm, ha. Quinn stared at the tent and the tent, well, didn't stare back, but stayed tent-like. A pink hue developed on Quinn's nape as he looked at the tent, and thoughts appeared in his mind. Minute changes took place and Quinn's magic happened as the pink shade stayed on Quinn's nape. All right, Quinn smiled, hopped off his bed, and walked to the bathroom. He looked at his right hand and smirked, I am counting on you, buddy. Let's go and have a good time. Scene break. For the next few days, the major topic of conversation in Hogwarts was how Harry Potter was the heir of Slytherin, and he was out for all Muggleborns in the castle. Sitting in the library, Quinn could hear the conversation of a group of the Hufflepuff who should have been in Herbology classes. But because of the heavy snow outside, they cancelled the classes. He could see that their heads were close together, and they were having what looked like an absorbing conversation. So anyway, a stout boy was saying, I told Justin to hide up in our dormitory. I mean to say, if Potter's marked him down as his next victim, it's best if he keeps a low profile for a while. Of course, Justin has been waiting for something like this to happen ever since he let it slip to Potter that he was a muggle-born. That's not the kind of thing you band about with Slytherin's air on the loose, is it? You definitely think it is Potter, then, Ernie, said a girl with blonde. Pigtails, anxiously. Hannah, said the stout boy solemnly, he is a parcel mouth. Everyone knows that is the mark of a dark wizard. Have you ever heard of a decent one who could talk to snakes? They called Slytherin himself Serpent Tongue. There was some heavy murmuring at this, and Ernie went on, remember what was written on the wall? Enemies of the air, beware. Potter had some sort of run-in with Filch. Next thing we know, Filch's cats attacked. That first year, Creevy was annoying Potter at the quid-ditch match, taking pictures of him while lying in the mud. Next thing we know, Creevy's been attacked. Does this mean that Potter would go after Professor Potter, said Hannah Abbott uncertainly, she is a muggle-born as well. A pitiful look appeared on her face, Professor Potter seems so nice. Now, she will become his target. Ernie lowered his voice mysteriously. The Hufflepuffs bent closer and Quinn balanced his chair on its back two legs to get nearer so that he could catch Ernie's words. 
No one knows how he survived that attack by you know who. I mean to say, he was only a baby when it happened. He should have been blasted into smithereens. Only a powerful dark wizard could have survived a curse like that. He dropped his voice until it was barely more than a whisper and said, that probably is why you know who wanted to kill him in the first place. Didn't want another dark lord competing with him. I wonder what other things Potter's been hiding. Then suddenly, the person in question barged in and slapped his hands on the question and leaned on it as he peered at the group of Hufflepuffs. All right, dumb tweaks. I am looking for Finch Fletchley, where is he? The Hufflepuff's worst fears had clearly been confirmed. They all looked fearfully at Ernie. What do you want with him? Asked Ernie in a quavering voice. He has been running his trap about me being the heir of Slytherin, Harry sneered and continued, I need to get it inside his head that I was just trying to help him. Ernie bit his white lips and then, taking a deep breath, said, We were all there. We saw what happened. Then you all saw that the bloody snake backed off when I spoke to it. Harry made hissing noises at the group and continued, Or, are you guy blind as well? All I saw, said Ernie stubbornly, though he was trembling as he spoke, was you speaking parcel tongue and chasing the snake toward Justin. I didn't chase it at him. Harry said, his voice shaking with anger. It didn't even touch him. It was a very near miss, said Ernie. And in case you're getting ideas, he added hastily, I might tell you that you can trace my family back through nine generations of witches and warlocks, and my blood's as pure as anyone's, so dash. Harry kicked the leg of the table and yelled, I don't give rat's ass about what sort of blood you have got. Ugh. He turned on his heel and stormed out of the library, earning himself a reproving glare from Madame Pants, who was polishing the gilded cover of a large spell book. Oh boy, you made he made it much worse, thought Quinn looking at the Hufflepuff group, look how scared they are. He hissed at them for Merlin's sake. He shook his head and sighed, this Harry Potter isn't good at damage control. Boy, this is going to blow up, goody. A smirk surfaced on Quinn's face as a green appeared on his neck, deepening by the second, changing Quinn's magic. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, underscore underscore OT underscore dash underscore 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 underscore. Pink, underscore underscore S underscore dash underscore 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 underscore. Red, underscore R underscore underscore H dash underscore underscore underscore. Yellow, underscore underscore EE underscore dash underscore 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 underscore. Violet, underscore R I underscore E dash underscore 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 underscore. Green, underscore underscore V underscore dash underscore 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 underscore. Chapter 57, Harry Potter and Tom Marvel Riddle Author's Note Regarding the Direction of This Story. Read if you don't like the now dubbed colors arc. I will be honest, I wasn't expecting that much of a pushback against this concept. But after I thought about it I realized that the other stories have betrayed you guys because of something similar happening and then things going south. To the readers who don't know about me that much, I would like to tell you guys that I am not one of those deep-thinking authors who can churn out storylines so unique that it stands out from the canon plot. I love the canon timeline. I like to stick to the source material. You guys saw how I removed Ginny as the Horcrux host, but then a few chapters later, I brought the storyline back to close to the canon by Mrs. Norris Petrification. The canon plot gives me comfort, which I really like. The Cursed Vault wasn't even my idea. I discovered the existence of the Cursed Vaults in the games from a Discord member slash fellow writer. I admit I adapted it so that Quinn could do his own thing because I remember a reader telling me that Quinn and the story would become a slave to the canon plot at this rate. This turned out to be good as I was able to spend an entire volume slash story year away from the plot with just a few intersections. Perfect for that point of the story. Asterisk. Now, we came to this year, Quinn's third year slash canon second year slash chamber of secrets. I introduced the colors arc, I am using this now. The response is not so great. A lot of readers said that this ruined the story for them. That it is cliche, overused, and doesn't make sense. But, please take a moment as I bring to your attention the key features of this story. Dash asterisk asterisk. First is that Quinn is a pragmatic character. Thank you at Passive for using this adjective to describe Quinn. But a lot of you thought that because of the colors I am derailing the character because he is being influenced. I would like to assure you guys that Quinn won't be going overboard. He would do things that are slightly out of character, but they won't be things like rape or torture or any other over-the-top things. The only time you guys might feel a little discomfort from his actions would come in the climax, a two-chapter simultaneous release. You don't have to worry about him going batshit crazy and switching to the dark side. A lot of you may even like the things he will do under the influence of the colors. Dash asterisk asterisk. The second feature of this story is the steady progression of Quinn's power level. This is one of the top selling points if not the best selling point of this story. It doesn't help me and the story if I throw it away. He is not up from the get-go, he works for the power he gains. I am not looking to kick him up the power chart in one fell swoop by using the colors because in the last two chapters you can see that the colors are improving his magic. There is a twist during the climax. But that doesn't mean that it would be any RF. I may sometimes like to read stories without ups and downs, adversity, and trials, but I don't enjoy writing them. I showed it last year when he almost froze to death. So, I would like to say that this isn't my way to give a huge power boost to Quinn. Dash asterisk asterisk. 
This isn't a feature, but a complaint that Quinn shouldn't come under the influence of colors because he has a clumency. But, I haven't even told you guys the magic behind the colors. True, it has a major mental slash mind portion, but even then, I have explained nothing about what the rune circles down in the vault did to Quinn. The reason why he is under influence despite a clumency? I already mentioned one half, half, of the reason already. It just needs the other one half, half, so that it would click in the minds of the readers and make you pop out a reaction like ah, that is why. At least I hope so. I will explain it later when Quinn manages to escape the colors. Dash asterisk asterisk. Now, the reason why I choose to add colors arc to this story. At first, it was just an idea I thought was good and entertaining. But as I wrote, at passive, Big Brain Helper, told me that the vaults should help Quinn gain slash learn something. He told me that when the founders built Hogwarts, their main motive was to teach young ones about magic. Even though the Dada, history of magic, muggle studies, and divination doesn't reflect that motive, the main objective of Hogwarts is to impart knowledge. So, I decided that I would try to write the story in such a way that every vault would be a way for Quinn to grow not only as a magic user but also as a person. It is my way of telling that Hogwarts did help Quinn grow as a person. That him giving the school seven years of life isn't going to waste. I didn't think this while writing the icy vault, but still, Quinn gained perseverance and caution from it because he didn't give up even after he almost died. And caution so that he won't make hasty mistakes. Dash asterisk asterisk. This vault and the colors are actually a major slash good slash important point in the storyline as it allows me to answer a few unanswered questions from the very first volume, pre-Hogwarts. If any of you guys noticed the name of this volume you would have known that the choice between Hogwarts and Bosbatten was an illusion. The aftermath which will come in the summer after the school year will give you guys a chance to know Quinn a lot more. It will be serious character development that will allow you to connect to Quinn. You guys can level up with Quinn too. For reference check out the image in the paragraph comment. Refresh if you can't see it. This volume also gives me the chance to tie up some loose ends and gives me the ability to create some new loose ends that I can tie up later in the story. Dash asterisk asterisk. And finally, I can't snap this arc out of existence because I have 7 chapters in my stack out of which 5 chapters are on Patreon, and the remaining 2 are for rainy days. So, if you really don't want to read this arc, I would suggest that you start stacking up chapters so that you can blaze through them in one sitting and don't have to sit through something you guys don't enjoy every single day till this is over. Dash asterisk asterisk. And last but not the least, I would again reassure you that Quinn would be back to his dandy self by the end of this volume slash year. In fact, he would be better as I would have injected a booster shot of character development. I would iterate something I stated in the auxiliary chapter of this novel. Let's start something new, hoping it would turn out into something enjoyable. So, give this content a chance, and I hope that this novel would stand up to your expectations. Asterisk. The above message was from the author fiction only reader. The following message is from the person behind fiction only reader. Click this paragraph comment to read the message. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Start of the story, you guys didn't want colors, so you won't get in this one. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. You are an idiot, yelled Ivy, glaring at her brother, who was looking away from her. You hissed at people in the library. Everybody there heard you hissing. She tore a handful of grass from the ground and threw it at him, what were you thinking? I wasn't thinking, all right, barked Harry, cleaning the blades of grass from his clothes, they were being stupid, so I just did it to scare them. They are already plenty scare of you, scoffed Hermione, looking at the black lake in the distance. The castle had become a little too stuffy for Harry. So the gang decided to take a walk spending their time outside, away from the eyes of everyone in the castle. I don't understand what is wrong with everyone, Ron chimed in, lying in the grass, Harry isn't the heir of Slytherin. I am sure that it is that git, Malfoy. Just look at him, he hates muggle and muggleborns. And, if he had held his tongue for a few more days, said Ivy, pointing at Harry, then the polyjuice potion would have allowed us to get some information. Do you know how difficult it is to move around the castle with eyes following you everywhere? From the looks of it, Ivy was more worried about this situation than Harry. While the girl twin was pulling her hair in frustration, the boy twin was silently brooding. Harry decided he needed some time alone, away from Ivy's occasional glares and Hermione's quips. He stood up from his spot, ready to leave. Now, where are you going? asked Ivy. I just need some time alone, replied Harry, brushing his clothes, don't follow me. Ivy tried to stop him, but Harry ignored his sister and walked away from his friends, deciding to return to the castle. This wasn't how he wanted his second year to go. Last year, he had spent worrying about Snape and how he was trying to steal Philosopher's Stone, but in the end, it turned out it wasn't Snape, but Voldemort stuck to the back of his defense against dark arts, Quirrell. An entire year of his scar hurting, occasional headaches, and burning pains were stressful for him. Not to mention he had almost lost his sister to a troll, she would disagree. Thinking about his second year, Harry had hoped to be free of situations like these and hoped that it would be a carefree year with no extraordinary events, but it wasn't in his luck. Even before his year started, Harry had met with an oddity, a house elf by the name of Dobby, who warned him not to go to Hogwarts this year, talking about a danger that awaited him, but Harry had ignored the elf's ramblings and thought little about them. At the start of the year, he and Ron had been blocked from entering Platform 9 and 3 quarters. They had flown to Hogwarts in Ron's father's car. 
which, in foresight, was an idiotic decision. A decision that had almost gotten him expelled. Harry's mom had scolded him for hours and had been angry with him for a couple of weeks. Even his usual chill dad had been furious at Harry because multiple muggles had noticed the car flying in the sky. Not to mention that the Whomping Willow had almost killed them by crushing the car while they were inside it. He and Ron got dirty looks from Professor Sprout because of the damage to the tree by the car. His new defense against dark arts didn't turn out like he imagined and taught them nothing and just made them recreate the scenes from his books and had them write poems about him and his achievements. His detentions with Lockhart were a menial work of replying to fan letters and listening to him ramble on how to get famous and earn fame. Then came the whole chamber of secret debacle with the heir of Slytherin. Harry was determined the heir as many people suspected him of being the heir and petrified Filch's cat. He and his friends were sure that Draco was the heir of Slytherin from the way he enjoyed looking at the bloody message and his very public despise of muggles and muggleborns. Hermione had come up with the plan to use the polyjuice potion to infiltrate the Slytherin house and gain some information, but in the time required to brew the potion, Colin Creevy had also been petrified. And, he had found that the murderous bludger during the Quidditch game was Dobby the house elf's doing so that Harry would get injured and go back home. Harry has almost strangled the scrawny elf in anger. Above that, Harry had been hearing some disturbing voices about killing, blood, ripping, and all kinds of creepy dialogues. He had tried to share this with his friends, but it seemed no one else could hear the voices. Just when he thought that the year couldn't get worse, he, and the rest of the school, found that he was a parcel mouth and could speak the language of the serpentine creatures. Something that was widely associated with dark wizards. From that situation, Justin Finch Fletchley had freaked out when he had tried to help him by asking the snake to leave Justin alone. The fallout was Justin being a Scarday cat, and the entire school had made up their minds that he was the heir of Slytherin. Bloody Fletchley, cursed Harry, stamping his feet as he walked, if I get my hands on him, he is looking for an ass hooping. Harry stamped up the stairs and turned along another corridor, which was particularly dark, a strong, icy draft that was blowing through a loose window pane had extinguished the torches. He was halfway down the passage when he tripped headlong over something lying on the floor. He turned to squint at what he had fallen over and felt as though his stomach had dissolved. Justin Finch Fletchley was lying on the floor, rigid and cold, a look of shock frozen on his face, his eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. And that wasn't all. Next to him was another figure, the strangest sight Harry had ever seen. It was nearly headless Nick, no longer pearly white and transparent, but black and smoky, floating immobile and horizontal, six inches off the floor. His head was half off, and his face wore an expression of shock identical to Justin's. Harry got to his feet, his breathing fast and shallow, his heart doing a kind of drum roll against his ribs. When he said he was going to get his hands on Justin, he meant nothing like this. He looked wildly up and down the deserted corridor and saw a line of spiders scuttling as fast as they could away from the bodies. The only sounds were the muffled voices of teachers from the classes on either side. I could run, and no one would ever know I had been here. Harry thought, but he couldn't just leave them lying here. He had to get help. Would anyone believe he had nothing to do with this? As he stood there, panicking, a door right next to him opened with a bang. Peeves the poltergeist came shooting out. Why it's Potty Wee Potter, cackled Peeves, knocking Harry's glasses askew as he bounced past him. What's Potter up to? Why is Potter lurking dash? Peeves stopped, halfway through a midair somersault. Upside down, the ghost spotted Justin and nearly headless Nick. He flipped the right way up, filled his lungs, and before Harry could stop him, screamed. Attack, attack, another attack, no mortal or ghost is safe, run for your lives, attack. Crash, 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 door after door flew open along the corridor, and people flooded out. For several long minutes, there was a scene of such confusion that Justin was in danger of being squashed, and people kept standing in nearly headless nick. Harry found himself pinned against the wall as the teachers shouted for quiet. Professor McGonagall came running, followed by her own class, one of whom still had black and white striped hair. She used her wand to set off a loud bang, which restored silence and ordered everyone back into their classes. No sooner had the scene cleared somewhat than Ernie the Hufflepuff arrived, panting, on the scene. Caught in the act. Ernie yelled, his face stark white, pointing his finger dramatically at Harry. Peeves was bobbing overhead, now grinning wickedly, surveying the scene, Peeves always loved chaos. As the teachers bent over Justin and nearly headless Nick, examining them, Peeves broke into song. Oh, Potter, you rotter, oh, what have you done? You're killing off students, you think it's good fun dash. That's enough, Peeves, barked Professor McGonagall, and Peeves, zoomed away backward, with his tongue out at Harry. Professor Flitwick and Professor Sinistra of the astronomy department carried Justin up to the hospital wing, but nobody seemed to know what to do for nearly headless Nick. In the end, Professor McGonagall conjured a large fan out of thin air, which she gave to Ernie with instructions to waft nearly headless Nick up the stairs. This Ernie did, fanning Nick along with like a silent black hovercraft. This left Harry and Professor McGonagall alone together. This way, Potter, she said. Professor, said Harry at once, I swear I didn't dash. This is out of my hands, Potter, replied Professor McGonagall curtly. They marched in silence around a corner, and she stopped before a large and exceptionally ugly stone gargoyle. I am screwed, Harry thought as he stared at the gargoyle, so, screwed. Scene break. 
Hogwarts hadn't changed in the years he had studied here in his day. The castle was the same as ever, a magical and majestic building standing for a millennium. The professors and students had changed, but that changed nothing in the ambience of the mystical castle of Hogwarts. Children's chatter, portraits passing their time, the specters floating around the corridors, and house elves hurrying around doing their work. Everything was the same as the time he had studied and stayed here. In the night's cover, he roamed in the spacious corridors, feeling the cool breeze caressing his face. He had been walking around Hogwarts ever since he had got here, it was his home, after all, it was the only place that accepted him, provided him shelter and the means to be different than others like he always meant to be. Being sorted into the Slytherin house was a nod to his ancestor Salazar Slytherin. The proof that the blood in his veins was of a noble lineage, a genealogy of the highest order. He saw it as the sign that he was meant to great things and destined to stand above others. Due to his exceptional acting abilities, he could convince virtually all the Hogwarts staff and instructors that this facade was his true personality. The sole exception to this was Dumbledore, who, though not necessarily suspicious of him, never forgetting about his misdeeds or his unsettling behavior during their first meeting. In turn, he realized that he had been careless in showing Dumbledore his true character upon their first meeting and never attempted to win him over as he had with his other instructors. In time, he came to fear and despise Dumbledore. The old goat was too much of a hindrance to him. But, now he was here, and Dumbledore had no idea that it was all his doing. Gazing down, he admired the green trims on the clothing, fitting to his status as a member of House Slytherin. The greatest of the four, the noblest of them, and the one who knew what was best for the wizarding world. He made his way to the gloomiest, most depressing bathroom he had ever set foot in. Under a large, cracked, and spotted mirror were a row of chipped sinks. The floor was damp and reflected the dull light given off by the stubs of a few candles, burning low in their holders, the wooden doors to the stalls were flaking and scratched, and one of them was dangling off its hinges. Looking around, he saw that the girl wasn't there, maybe occupying another bathroom in the castle. It was better this way, he didn't want the girl to stare at him every time he visited here, it got bothersome quickly. He walked to one of the unassuming sinks in the tattered bathroom and looked at one of the copper taps with a small snake engraved on it. A smile made it on his face at the sight of the little snake. Open, he said. Except that the words weren't in English, a strange hissing had escaped him, and at once, the tap glowed with a brilliant white light and spun. Next second, the sink moved, the sink, in fact, sank, right out of sight, leaving a large pipe exposed, a pipe wide enough for a man to slide into. He lowered himself slowly into the pipe, then let go. It was like rushing down an endless, slimy, dark slide. He could see more pipes branching off in all directions, but none as broad as his, which twisted and turned, sloping steeply downward, and knew that he was falling deeper below the school than even the dungeons. At the end of the pipe's end, he jumped and expertly landed on the damp floor of a dark stone tunnel large enough to stand in. Lumos, he chanted the incantation, and his wand's tip lit up with white. Walking on the tunnel's wet floor made loud slapping noise against the water, and the light from the wand cast shadows on the soaking walls that looked monstrous in the wand light. The tunnel was quiet as a graveyard at night, and the only sound was the occasional crunch made when he stepped on the bones of small animals like rats littered around the floor. The wand light shone the path after a dark bend and shed light over a gigantic snakeskin of a vivid, poisonous green, lying curled and empty across the tunnel floor. The creature that had shed it must have been twenty feet long at least. He smiled as he glided his hand against the snakeskin, feeling its texture as he walked beside the humongous shedding. And then, at last, as he crept around yet another bend, he saw a solid wall ahead on which two entwined serpents were carved, their eyes set with great, glinting emeralds. Open, came the words in a low, faint hiss. The serpents parted as the wall cracked open, the halves slid smoothly out of sight. Inside stood at the end of a very long, dimly lit chamber. Towering stone pillars entwined with more carved serpents rose to support a ceiling lost in darkness, casting long, black shadows through the odd, greenish gloom that filled the place. Every footstep echoed loudly off the shadowy walls as the hollow eye sockets of the stone snakes seemed to be following him. Then, as he drew level with the last pair of pillars, a statue high as the chamber itself loomed into view, standing against the back wall. He had to crane his neck to look up into the giant face above, it was ancient and monkeyish, with a long, thin beard that fell almost to the bottom of the wizard's sweeping stone robes, where two enormous grey feet stood on the smooth chamber floor. Speak to me, Slytherin, greatest of the Hogwarts Four, he hissed and watched as the giant stone face moved, mouth opening, wider and wider, to make a huge black hole. And something was stirring inside the statue's mouth. Something was slithering up from its depths. Come out, he smiled as he watched the enormous body hit the stone floor of the chamber. A serpent uncoiled itself from Slytherin's mouth. He stared at the titanic serpent as it stared back at him. If he had been anyone else, he would have been dead with a single look from the king of serpents. But because he spoke in the language of snakes, Parseltongue, the basilisk didn't kill him with a gaze that could kill with a single glance. A translucent third eyelid covered its acid yellow eyes, blocking the innate magic that resided in the basilisk's eyes. The translucent eyelids were part of basilisk's biology, present there in case the snake didn't want to use its killing gaze. You did well. Another mudblood down. Just like the great Slytherin wanted, he hissed at the snake. More, kill, rip, blood. The basilisk hissed in reply. The basilisk was a dreadful and dangerous beast. 
a horrifying monster with dark green scales, that creature was a violent and bloodthirsty beast of titanic size. After being put to sleep inside the chamber for centuries, it wanted nothing but to get out and rampage. More will come, he laughed, as soon as I gain a body, we will reap lives of those who are inferior and unworthy. He laughed loudly and proclaimed. Soon, I, Tom Marvelo Riddle, will return to this world as Lord Voldemort and take my rightful place as the ruler of wizard kind and beyond. But before that, Riddle took out a diary from his robes and spoke, I want to know more about Harry Potter, the boy who lived. I want to know how a one-year-old babe took down my future. Riddle planned to get the diary to the boy, wanting to find more about him and what he possessed to defeat the Dark Lord. The basilisk hissed something that made Riddle chuckle in reply, yes, he will be quite fun to play with. He looked at the basilisk and recalled, he has a mudblood girl in his entourage, we should go for her next. The basilisk hissed in horrid glee, thrashing its tail in delight. A boy and basilisk stood in a dreary chamber, planning to go after their next victim. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Harry Potter, boy who lived, boy who broods. Tom Marvelo Riddle, 16 years old, Lord Voldemort, soul fragment, heir of Slytherin. Chapter 58, Teaching the Slytherin Duo Oh boy, you have been eating a lot these past few weeks, haven't you? Asked Eddie as he looked to his side, if you didn't eat with proper table manners, you would be indistinguishable from Marcus. Quinn ate another piece of sausage before speaking, I have been feeling starved these past few weeks, he swallowed a mouthful of fries and continued, it is like there is a bottomless pit in my stomach. I am here to tell you something, my friend, you can eat and eat and eat, but nothing will ever fill that void, spoke Marcus from across the table, you want a slice of banoffee pie? I feel you, brother, said Quinn, pointing his fork at Marcus, and, yes, I will take two slices. My sweet tooth is tingling. Quinn food moaned as he ate some of the banoffee pie that Marcus passed on to him. An orange hue developed on his nape as Quinn indulged himself in the delicious food. Maybe I should live in the kitchen with the house elves, thought Quinn as he nodded towards Marcus while pointing towards the dessert. This is damn good. The last few weeks had been brilliant for and to Quinn. He had found himself enjoying his student life, feeling that he was on cloud seven all the time. He always had a skip in his step, a smile on his face, and joy in his words. He felt nothing could pull him down to earth. Quinn was sure that if the number of times he had broken into songs were stringed together, they would be enough for an entire script of a musical play. His magic had been improving every day at a visible rate, and Quinn couldn't be more excited than seeing his connection with his magic improve every other day. It was like he had been wearing weights all his life, and now they were removed. Casting spells was becoming easier, and his magic responded to him faster and smoother like never before. If his magic before the improvement was him pulling water out of well, and he had to work to mold his magic into spells, then right now, his magic was waiting for him to give a single command, and it would spring out with no effort. His magic was a servant waiting to fulfill his every whim. No adversity could make him feel helpless and hopeless. Spending time in Room of Requirement to destroy things was becoming his new hobby. If someone stumbled upon the Room of Requirements during Quinn's occupancy, they would have a heart attack by the sheer amount of destructive and dark magic remnants in the room. The pure exhilaration Quinn felt when he exerted his magic to annihilate everything in his way, a feeling beyond words. It made him feel powerful beyond measure. He felt empowered, it made him feel like he could do anything, and nothing was outside his capabilities. Quinn finished his meal, patting his belly in culinary satisfaction, and tapped danced his way outside the Great Hall. When Quinn turned a bend, a stone-faced blonde greeted him, scaring the shit out of him. Bloody hell. Quinn jumped back in shock as he stared at Daphne Greengrass standing there with her arms crossed. Hello, said Tracy, revealing herself from behind Daphne with a grin on her face and twinkled in her eye. She covered her mouth in laughter and commented, that was wicked fun. Yeah, it was wicked scary. You almost scared the soul out of my body. Quinn patted his heart and asked, what is it? Tracy stepped forward and asked, we were wondering if you would help us with a spell. We have been having some problems with the cast. Quinn quirked his brow and spoke, sure, I can help. What is the spell? It is the Cezanne pull spell, replied Daphne. Her face was twisted in frustration and irritation. The spell had been giving her and Tracy a lot of problems. No matter how much they tried, the magic refused to operate properly. Quinn's eyes shined in joy, oh boy, carpe retractum, the Cezanne pull. He clapped his hands, do you know it is one of my favorite spells? So, you will help us, asked Daphne, surprising Quinn with her forwardness. She usually let Tracy do the talking, but right now, she was taking the lead. The truth was that Daphne didn't like things she couldn't figure out, and this spell had been giving her problems longer than she anticipated. All right, I will help out, said Quinn, I am free today, so do you want to start after classes? Yes, replied both the girls in unison. Perfect, then it is decided, smiled Quinn, we will meet after classes. Scene break. Daphne and Tracy entered the classroom in which the three had decided to meet and practice. There they saw Quinn sitting there on a stool. It looked like he hadn't noticed the two Slytherin girls enter the room. He was sitting there with a dazed look on his face. Looking into the distance with a blank look on his face. Daphne and Tracy stilled for a moment and stared at Quinn with mild surprise. In the time they had known Quinn, they had never seen him like this, doing nothing and zoning out while sitting in a chair. Every time they had seen Quinn, he was doing something. 
Quinn would always have something to do like read a book, or scribble or draw on a paper, or talking to someone, but never in their time had these two seen Quinn doing, well, nothing. Then there was the look in his eyes. The Quinn they knew always had a focused look in his eyes like he was always thinking and on point, and the depth in his stone grey orbs reflected the knowledge held in them. The current shallow and dazed was out of place for Quinn. And finally, the thing that stood out was Quinn's posture. No matter what the time, Quinn always sat with his back straight and shoulders back, but the Quinn in front of them had a slouch in his posture, his back was curved, and shoulders hunched slightly. It was so unusual that Daphne and Tracy felt worried for Quinn, seeing him so different from his usual self. There was a feeling of conflict rising inside them. There was a stark difference between this version of Quinn and the image of Quinn they had in their mind. Tracy stepped forward and carefully voiced, Hey Quinn, are you alright? Her words seemed to snap Quinn out of his daze as he turned his face to the duo. The two girls saw focus return to Quinn's eyes as he stood up from his stool, recognition flashing in his eyes. A smile bloomed on his face as he greeted them, Good evening, you two. Now that you are here, let's get started. Daphne and Tracy stared at Quinn with another bout of shock at the sudden change in energy. Just a moment ago, Quinn looked like he could sit on his stool doing nothing but stare at the wall for hours, but the next second, he was on his feet, full of rigor and ready to get the practice session started. Hey Quinn, are you sure you are alright? Asked Tracy, still worried about her friend, we can do this another day if you aren't feeling well. Quinn turned his body towards them, a confused expression clear on his face, like he wasn't sure what Tracy was talking about. What do you mean? He chuckled, there is nothing wrong with me. In fact, I can't be feeling any better. Quinn clapped his hands and showed a confused wrinkle in his brows, come on, let's get moving, or do you not want to learn? Tracy looked at Daphne and asked her best friend what to do with her eyes. Daphne turned to look at Quinn, who was peering at them with a confused look on his face, his hands raised, asking them what was happening. Daphne also felt a little worried about Quinn, but looking at him now, he looked normal. Let's start, said Daphne, announcing her decision to the other two in the room. That is the spirit, grinned Quinn, okay, stand here. Yeah, side by side like that. Excellent. Daphne and Tracy stood side by side, standing close to one of the classroom's walls, and took out their wands at ready. Quinn, who had walked to the stool he was sitting at before, looked back and saw the two girls with their wands out. He waved his hands and spoke, all right, let's sheath the wands for just a minute or two. He picked up two ropes from the corner and walked to the girls, handing them each a rope. Quinn smiled when he saw the confused look on their faces, the Cezanne pull spell produces a magical, retractable cord of light that could be used to pull objects towards the caster, or, if the target was fixed in place, to pull the caster towards the target. He pulled out his fake wand, and the ropes uncurled into straight lines, another swing, and two iron weights transfigured on the ends of the ropes. The irons had substantial weight but weren't heavy enough for the girls to have difficulty pulling. So, you are going to be pulling when you see Zan pull spell, so it would be good if you know what does it feel like to pull something. He raised his hands when Daphne was about to speak, I know you know what it is like to pull things but do it now so it is fresh in your mind. He walked between the two ropes and continued, I am making you pull these weights because if you do it now, you would remember it more vividly than ever before. Your brain knows that I am making you do it for the spell, so it would remember the sensation much more clearly. Now, pull on those ropes and get a clear feeling. He gestured towards the rope before stepping to the side, go. The two girls looked skeptical at the exercise but did it anyway, putting both of their hands on the rope and then pulling at the iron weights. Let me ask you a question, spoke Quinn, gaining their attention. When you learn a spell, do you understand it better when you learn the mechanics behind it? When the professor explains what the spell is actually doing, does it help? Of course, that is obvious, replied Tracy pulling on the rope. Quinn nodded and explained, understanding and comprehension are an essential part of the magic. If you understand what you are doing, things get a lot easier, much simpler. He raised his fake wand and pointed it at his other open palm, and a miniature version of Quinn in ice appeared on his palm, knowing means having control over what you are doing, and control in lack of better words is good. He walked in between the two girls and faced the same way they did, the Cezanne pull spell is a retractable cord, so while you won't be pulling and your magic would be doing the work for you. Quinn raised his fake wand and shot out a red-yellow cord of light at the opposing wall. The end of the cord attached itself to the wall, sticking to the surface. Daphne and Tracy looked at the end attached to the wall to Quinn, who put his hand on the cord, and their eyes widened when they saw the cord detached from the wand tip and rest in Quinn's hand. How are you doing that? exclaimed Daphne, you can't detach the cord from the wand. That should break the spell. If you know what you are doing. If you understand the mechanics, Quinn cracked a smile, you will have, control, control over what you are doing. He pulled on the cord, and girls could see it taut because of the pull. Now, that was enough, Quinn waved his fake wand, the weights vanished, and the ropes curled up, let's see you girls try it. He took a step back, giving space to the girl, Carpe Retractum is the incantation, and the wand movement is in the shape of V. Now, off you go. The two girls readied their wands, pointed them at the wall, and cast. Carpe Retractum. Two flimsy cords of light shot out of their wands, darting towards the wall, but fell down to the floor before reaching it. The two turned back to look at Quinn, and the older Ravenclaw just said, Both of you have to be more aggressive, provide more magic, and if I am right, you guys should focus more on the wall. 
The spell would conjure the cord for you, you need to want the cord to go to the wall. Here, look at this, said Quinn stepping forward and pointing his fake wand at the stool. A thick cord of light shot out of his wand and wrapped around the barstool in the distance. See, I made the cord wrap around the barstool. It usually sticks, but because I wanted it to wrap around the target. You have to be clear about what you are doing. He gestured to them to try again. The two girls raised their wands, and as Quinn instructed, they focused more on the wall. Both wanted their cords to stick to the wall in front of them. Carpe retractum. Two cords of light exploded out of their wands and darted towards the wall. Both cords reached the wall and stuck to the surface, Daphne's cord was faster than Tracy's and struck the wall first. Excellent, well done, congratulated Quinn, but, hold it, don't stop the spell. He stepped forward, walking halfway to the opposing wall. H flicked both the cord to check them the tangibility and pulled on them to see the adhesive quality at the end. He nodded before turning to them, all right, everything seems good. Tracy, you have to work on getting the cord faster to the target, but you're stuck more firmly to the wall. He turned to Daphne and remarked, Daphne, you had a great launch, but you need to work on the tangibility of your cord. It looks like it would snap if there is too much weight at the end. Scene break. Quinn met with Daphne and Tracy a couple more times to walk them through the spell. Today, we are going to pull on stuff, Quinn said, standing in front of the two girls, did you two practice in your own time? We did, the girls replied. All right, then let's move on, he pointed to the two barstools and said, aim at the barstools and pull them towards you. Wands at ready, he instructed while stepping out of the way, go nuts. Red-yellow cords of light darted to the barstools and adhered to the wood. The girls had enough practice with the spell and could stick the cords to the target with outstanding success. Quinn silently watched from the side, observing them cast the magic, trying to pull the barstool towards them, but their efforts were giving irregular success at best. You guys are pulling your arms back to pull, don't do that, spoke Quinn as he stepped forward and pointed at their arms, the magic is a retractable cord, you don't have to physically pull on the cord, you have to retract it. Quinn put his hand and took out a standard yellow retractable tape measure, showing it to the girls. It was one of the things that resided in Quinn's robes. Take this for an example, he pulled the metallic tape measure out of its casing, now, observe, he continued and released the tape, and the girls watched as the yellow metal strip rushed back inside the casing. It is something like this, said Quinn, this what you call retractable. You need to suck in the magical cord back into your wand. He walked to their front and grinned mischievously. Taking out his fake wand, he pointed it at Tracy and shot out the cord of Cezanne pull spell. The cord wrapped around her. Tracy let out a surprised yelp before she screamed when she was pulled towards Quinn, who caught her with his arms and spun her around in circles, while Tracy laughed in fun with little fear mixed in. Quinn widely grinned as he put Tracy down, who walked unsteadily because of the dizziness and walked like a drunk person. Daphne shifted her gaze from Tracy to Quinn and saw the grin, and her eyes widened in realization, oh no, you don't dash, but she was late as Quinn had already shot a Cezanne pull cord towards her. She let out a similarly startled yelp when she was pulled towards Quinn. Unlike Tracy, she wasn't spun around circles and was held close to Quinn. He took her waist with his hands, holding her close to him. When she looked up towards Quinn's face, she saw a smile different from Quinn's usual smile. She saw Quinn raise his hand and tuck a stray strand of her hair behind her ear. If you weren't a second year, I would have invited you out to Hogsmeade, she heard Quinn speak, what a pity. He pulled her closer for a second before letting her go and moving to Tracy, helping her stand up, she had sat down because of the dizziness. Daphne Greengrass stood in a distracted daze, thinking about what had just happened. She didn't know what to make of the interaction she just had with Quinn. One thing was for sure, she wouldn't be forgetting about this for a long time. After five lessons in two weeks, Quinn trained Daphne and Tracy in the seas and pull to the point that they could pull it off every single time flawlessly. Their original flimsy cords had thickened to something respectable, and they could pull anything with reasonable weight towards them without breaking a sweat. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, underscore underscore OT underscore dash A underscore underscore D underscore underscore. Pink, underscore U underscore underscore dash underscore underscore X underscore underscore I underscore. Red, underscore R underscore underscore H dash underscore underscore underscore. Yellow, underscore underscore E E underscore dash underscore underscore A underscore underscore T I underscore. Violet, underscore R I underscore E dash underscore underscore P underscore underscore B underscore underscore. Green, underscore underscore V underscore dash underscore 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 I underscore I underscore. Orange, underscore 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 T underscore underscore and underscore dash dash underscore underscore L underscore. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, teacher extraordinaire. Tracy Davis, Slytherin, learning magic and having fun. Daphne Green, Slytherin, learning magic and feeling confused. Chapter 59, Polly Juice Incident, Debt and Diary Harry Potter, Ronald Weasley, Hermione Granger, and Ivy Potter were planning an infiltration operation into the Slytherin House common room by employing the miraculous Polly Juice potion. The potion allowed a person to change their appearance to someone else's and all it took was a strand of their hair. The four Gryffindor stood in Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, gathered around the stall that issued thick black smoke while Hermione stirred the cauldron full of bubbling, glutinous potion. Does everyone have the hairs of their targets? asked Hermione. 
When the other three nodded, Hermione continued, Good, now we need to separate the potion into the four glasses and add the hairs. While Hermione poured the polyjuice potion into goblets, Ivy spoke up, I sneaked these spare robes out of the laundry, throwing a sack on the floor, we will need robes with Slytherin trims, so wear these before exiting here. The four of them stared into the cauldron. Close up, the potion looked like thick, dark mud, bubbling sluggishly. I'm sure I've done everything right, said Hermione, nervously rereading the splotched page of Mist Potent Potions. It looks like the book says it should, once we've drunk it, we'll have exactly an hour before we change back into ourselves. Hermione handed the goblets to her three friends and instructed, add your hairs to the goblets. The four added the hair into the bubbling goblets and watched as the potion hissed loudly like a boiling kettle and frothed madly. Harry Potter added Gregory Goyle's hair strand into his potion and watched as it turned into cocky color. Ron Weasley added Vincent Crabbe's hair strand into his goblet and the potion frothed before turning a dark, murky brown. Hermione Granger dropped a strand of hair from Tracy Davis into hers and it turned into a lilac color. At last, Ivy Potter inserted a blonde strand from the head of Daphne Greengrass and watched as an icy blue color spread through the potion. Now, get into the stalls and down them, said Ivy, don't drink them out here and change before drinking because your clothes won't fit. Good call, commented Ron, picking a set of clothes from the sack, and the others followed. Careful not to spill a drop of their polyjuice potion, the golden squad slipped into their individual stalls. Ready, called out Harry. Ready, came Ron's, Hermione's, and Ivy's reply. One, two, three dash pinching their noses, the four chugged down their potion in two to three gulps. There were groans and grunts from all four people before there was silence, followed by gasps of shock, and finally, the rustling of clothes could be heard at the end. Three people came out at the same time and looked at each other with a stunned expression. This is unbelievable, said Ron, approaching the mirror and prodding. Crab's flat nose. Unbelievable. His voice was exactly the same as Crab's, and it surprised Ron a lot. This is wicked and jarring at the same time, Goyle's low rasp of a voice issued from Harry's mouth. The two transformed boys turned their heads to look at Ivy, who had altered into Daphne Greengrass, watching herself in a broken mirror with a complicated expression on her face. Harry, Goyle, and Ron, Crab, watched with wide eyes as Ivy, Daphne, exhaled before an expressionless look took its place on Daphne Greengrass's face. Wow, exclaimed Ron, she looks exactly like exactly like her. If Ron didn't know that the girl in front of her was Ivy, he would have bet his entire pocket money on Daphne Greengrass standing in front of him. Harry silently watched his sister put on the same expression as Daphne. He could understand the complicated look before the expressionless face, his twin sister and Daphne Greengrass did have a complicated relationship. Are you sure that Greengrass and Davis won't walk in on us? asked Harry. While Harry and Ron had put Crab and Goyle to sleep with mild sleeping potions, Tracy and Daphne were still awake and in the castle. Ivy stared at Daphne's face in the mirror for a while before replying, at this time, Tracy and Daphne are in the library doing their homework. Those two follow this schedule without fail, she paused before continuing, she is quite methodical about it. She sighed before speaking, we have plenty of time before those two will return to the Slytherin common room, so we don't have to worry about them. Harry nodded before noticing that Hermione wasn't out of her stall, Hermione, come one, we need to go, he called out while banging on Hermione's door. A high-pitched voice answered him, I I don't think I'm going to come after all. You go on without me. Hermione, we know Tracy Davis differs greatly from you, but no one's going to know it's you dash. No, really, I don't think I'll come. You three hurry up, you are wasting time dash said Hermione in a weirdly high-pitched voice. Harry looked at Ron, bewildered. That looks more like Goyle, said Ron. That's how he looks every time a teacher asks him a question. Hermione, are you okay? asked Ivy through the door. Fine, I'm fine. Go on, came Hermione's response. Ivy looked at her watch. Five of their precious sixty minutes had already passed. We will meet you back here, all right, she said. And, so Harry, Goyle, Ron, Crab, and Ivy, Daphne, were off to the Slytherin house common room. Scene break. Harry, Goyle, and Ron, Crab, walked ahead while Ivy, Daphne, walked a distance behind them because Daphne Greengrass wouldn't hang out, much less walk with the dumb duo of Slytherin. The three went down the marble staircase, all they needed now was a Slytherin that they could follow to the Slytherin common room, but there was nobody around. Any ideas, muttered Harry. Harry and Ron didn't know where the Slytherin common room was located in the dungeons. The Slytherins always come up to breakfast from over there, said Ron, nodding at the entrance to the dungeons. The words had barely left his mouth when a boy with black hair emerged from the entrance. Excuse me, said Ron, hurrying up to her. We've forgotten the way to our common room. Ivy, Daphne, who, just turned the bend, looked at the duo and frowned, what in the world are those two doing? She heard the last part of the sentence and had the urge to slap her forehead and then beat the two with a beater's bat. They didn't know the location of Slytherin common room, thought Ivy, of course, they didn't? Ugh, these idiots. The Ravenclaw boy looked at them with interest and chuckled, I beg your pardon. He pointed at his tie and trims on his robes, our common room? I'm a Ravenclaw. You guys must be really dumb, the Ravenclaw boy laughed till tears were coming out of his eyes. He looked them straight in their eyes and said, don't get lost, alright. 
Ivy felt embarrassed at her twin brother and their friend, not only because they jumped into the plan without knowing the first part and because the person who was laughing at them was the one person who she didn't want them to be embarrassed in front of. The Ravenclaw with black hair had stone grey eyes, and there was only one Ravenclaw with those features. Quinn West, groaned Ivy. She watched as Harry and Ron hurried down the stone steps into the darkness, their footsteps echoing particularly loudly as Crabs and Goyle's huge feet hit the floor. Quinn chuckled as he watched the two climb down to the dungeon and turned back to see Daphne standing there, and his eyes flashed. Green grass, he waved and smiled, fancy meeting you here. Ivy, Daphne, froze when she saw Quinn walked towards her but quickly gathered herself and spoke in a Daphne-esque fashion. Quinn, where is Tracy? asked Quinn, looking behind her, you two are usually together. She is in the library. She was behind on her homework, replied Ivy, Daphne. Oh, is that so, said Quinn. He thought of something and looked worried, is it because of the Duro transfiguration spell? Did she spend time too much time practicing the spell? Quinn sounded apologetic and continued, we have been practicing it a lot together. Maybe we should pull back a little. Ivy, who didn't know about what Quinn was speaking, just nodded. How about you, asked Quinn, are you comfortable transfiguring various materials into stone? Of course, spoke Ivy, imitating Daphne, it wasn't that difficult after I understood it. She replied such that even though her expression remained unchanged, her voice portrayed pride. Quinn smiled and then seemed to recall something, before I forget. I got the thing that you wanted, he put his hands in his robes, and the thing that came out was his wand. Ivy's, Daphne's, eyes widened as she felt ropes conjure around her and tightened around her body. The ropes pulled her back, and she was slammed against the wall. The next second, the wall behind her transfigured into a liquid form, covered her entire body, and hardened to trap her inside. What are you doing, shrieked Ivy, Daphne, looking angry and furious. You are not Daphne Greengrass, Quinn looked at her. She felt his eyes were looking right through her, so, who are you? What bloody nonsense are you talking about, she screamed, feeling panic bubbling inside her. Quinn peered at her and said, you see, when I called you Greengrass, you didn't show any reaction. Ivy felt confused at the statement, but Quinn cleared it for her. Recently, I switched the way I address her. I call her Daphne now, Quinn explained, she would roll her eyes at the start, but now she doesn't even bat an eye. With her personality, she would definitely quip at me reverting back to her family name. Next, we never practiced the Duro spell, so that gave you away, said, that was the second strike. Ivy was the full force of panic and couldn't think of anything to speak or rebuke. And, the last strike is this, Quinn raised his hand to reveal a wand in his hand, this isn't Daphne's wand. Ivy's eyes almost popped out, and she nearly screamed at Quinn to return her wand back. When did he take it from me, thought Ivy. So, you clearly not Daphne Greengrass. Which prompts the question, if you are not Daphne, then who are you? Quinn spoke as he looked at the wand in his hand. Hmm, a sound came out of him as he narrowed his eyes and then looked up at Daphne look alike. You know, now that I remember. There was a break-in in Professor Snape's potion ingredient storage. Now that I see you in the form of Daphne, the stolen ingredients were of the polyjuice potion, weren't they? A wide smirk formed on his face as he said, Professor Snape would be delighted if he found who stole his things. Ivy, in the form of Daphne, paled. The charges on her would be stealing from a professor, impersonating another student without their permission, intent to infiltrate another house's common room. This could very well end up in expulsion. She could clearly imagine how her mother and father would feel if this got out. But it seemed that her capturer wasn't done as he dropped another bombshell on her. Plus, I am now sure that Crab and Goyle I just saw now weren't the real one, said Quinn, those two are dumb, but not enough to forget the location of a place they have been living in for one and half year. He stared into her eyes and raised the wand, so, Ms. Ivy Potter, tell me what should I do with you? Ivy was beyond the point of shock and panic, and a strange clarity filled her, how did you know it is me? Quinn pointed at her wand, I remember this wand. I remember it from the dueling club. He pointed at his temple and smirked, you see, I have an excellent memory. He raised his hand to point in behind towards the dungeon entrance, I am willing to bet good money that those two were Harry Potter and Ronald Weasley. His smirk widened, now, imagine what would happen if I alert Professor Snape that two Gryffindors are inside the Slytherin common room. After the flying car incident, this would definitely kick those two out of the school. Ivy was once again back to feeling massive panic. Her father had faced a lot of criticism because of Harry's action at the start of the year. James Potter was an auror, and one of their responsibilities was to maintain the international statute of secrecy. It did not look good when one of his children was caught breaking the same code that could reveal the existence of magic to the world. I am willing to forget all of this if you owe me a huge favor, he tapped her nose before continuing, I am willing to spare your brother's reputation by letting all of this go. He is already suffering because of the whole air of Slytherin, and if he gets expelled, no matter what the reason, people would believe they sacked him for all the petrifications. Ivy was sure that she was about to die from shock. Harry's reputation was already at rock bottom because of the ridiculous rumor. She was sure that if the situation was given time, then Harry's reputation would improve. But right now, it would ruin Harry Potter, and in turn Potter family's reputation. Quinn stood straighter and spoke in a deeper voice, so, what is your decision, Potter princess? Ivy gulped before nodding. She had no choice but to agree. All right, I will do whatever you want. 
So don't reveal any of this. Quinn hummed with a bright smile before turning stern. Don't try to refuse this later because it will not go the way you want to. Do. You. Understand. Ivy nodded with a hard expression. Say that you understand. I understand. She spat out. Good, said Quinn, and the wall went back to normal, and the ropes restraining her also loosened before vanishing. Quinn patted her cheek before saying, Now, go hide until the effects of the potion wear off. Daphne is my friend, and I don't want a lookalike roaming around. He pointed at the wall behind her, your wand is right there. When Ivy looked back, she saw her wand stuck to the wall. It will come off in half a minute, said Quinn, now, while it was good profiting off you, I am busy person, so I would take my leave. Quinn softly smiled before walking away, leaving Ivy stunned, looking between Quinn's retreating and her wand stuck to the wall. Her thoughts were that this operation went nothing like she was expecting. Hers and Hermione's plan had been dismantled within minutes. They had thought that it would be a fairly straightforward plan for them to get the information from Draco, but the plan had failed before it even started. Hermione, for some reason, didn't come with them. Quinn West had caught her, restrained her, and had revealed her identity. Plus, he had forced her into being under his debt. She had didn't know how Ron and Harry were doing without her to guide them. Those two fools didn't even know the location of the Slytherin common room. Quinn West came in like a cool breeze and left like a terrifying typhoon. She would later find out that even though Harry and Ron had successfully gained entry to the Slytherin common room and had talked to Draco Malfoy, it turned out that Malfoy wasn't the one to open the Chamber of Secret. So, they were back to square one. And not to mention the accident Hermione had with the Polyjuice Potion and had gained a tail. When Ivy Potter found all of this, she, without an ounce of doubt and hesitation, classified this mission as a big fat failure. Scene break. Harry Potter heavily sighed as he walked toward the bathroom. He wasn't in a great mood. The entire school was literally against him and considered him the next Dark Lord. Everyone blamed him for the petrification of the Muggle-born students. And because of it, he was being avoided like the plague. Before, everyone would become noisy when he entered, but now, now, they would quiet down and avert their eyes so that they wouldn't catch his eyes. There were select few people he could spend time with, and now one of them was stuck in the hospital wing because she added the wrong hair into her polyjuice potion. Harry and Hermione quarreled a lot, but Harry seriously considered her to be one of his closest friends because of all the help she was last year. And, people who faced a troll and deadly obstacles together were bound to develop some comradery. This year was the same. Hermione was the one to come up with the polyjuice plan despite her love of rules and authority, showing that she treasured their friendship. His twin sister as well was acting weird and looked stressed about something since the whole polyjuice plan. She didn't join them inside the Slytherin common room because someone stopped her, she didn't specify who. When he asked what was wrong, she said that nothing was wrong and she was just stressed about Hermione and the Chamber of Secrets, but Harry could tell that there was something else. He stopped push when she started to get irritated and had left the matter alone. Finally, Ron was well. Ron. While he laughed at Hermione's furry appearance, Harry could tell that his best friend was worried about their friend. Harry, somewhere in his heart, blamed himself for dragging them in all this mess, and now all of them were stressed and worried. While Harry was brooding about his, depressing thoughts collided with someone and yelled, Hey, watch it, man but the other person didn't even look at him or say sorry and just ran off. Jerk, muttered Harry, and when he turned to walk, his foot kicked something. He looked down to see a small thin book with a shabby black cover. Harry picked it up and turned back to return it but, the person had already run off and out of his sight. Lowering his eyes to examine the thin book, Harry saw at once that it was a diary, and the faded year on the cover told him it was 50 years old. He opened it, and on the first page of the diary, Harry could barely read out the name T.M. Riddle written in smudged ink. When he turned the pages, and there were no words written on the pages. In the quiet and eerie corridor stood the lone figure of Harry Potter, staring at the black diary clutched in his hand with an unblinking gaze. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, out of character, gained a significant debt. Ivy Potter, Polly juiced into Daphne Greengrass, in debt. Harry Potter, boy who lived. Diary, a black diary. Hermione Granger, having furry problems, her tail feels weird. Chapter 60, Come Day, and Ivy's air of Slytherin theory it was a rare moment of peace in the last few months as Quinn laid in the cool grass looking up at the sky. The past few months had been a roller coaster for Quinn. His magic has been going through rapid change, not only in quantity but also in control. There were many types of magic that Quinn didn't think were possible for him for a couple of years were now within his grasps. His magic did his bidding with no complaints, and almost every day, dummies and targets of the room and requirements would get annihilated into smithereens. The restricted section of Hogwarts library had also proven to be helpful. The thing about the room of requirement was that it had been hidden for so long that nobody knew how it operated, and as such, no one knew how to add books to it. The books and tomes in the room of requirements knowledge base were extremely old. The books were from the founder's time, and as far as Quinn could tell, they weren't updated from that time, which meant that the room of requirement was missing out on a millennium's worth of advancements in magic. The room of requirements had a lot of knowledge that would be classified as lost knowledge. Lost knowledge was the knowledge about fields of magic lost to the magical civilization with time, but the thing about that lost magical knowledge from Room of Requirements was that a lot of it was too complex for Quinn. 
While Quinn's magical prowesses grew at an unprecedented rate, his knowledge about magic didn't experience a similar boost. He was still building his magical knowledge step by step. So, the restricted section of Hogwarts Library came in as resourceful because Hogwarts did a decent job at supplementing their library with new books throughout the ages. Quinn did notice that even though there was a lot of information about magic that could be hazardous if not handled or properly understood, there was nothing too crazy in the library. Dumbledore moderating the books in the library was one of Quinn's theories. Another theory was that Hogwarts was a school for children who came here to learn to control their magic. Those children might not need books that delved into high-level complexities about magic. As such, the Hogwarts administration never thought of buying books above a certain level. The magical world and not just magical Britain didn't have a university system for higher education. Instead, it followed an apprentice system to gain higher knowledge about magic. You could buy high-level magic knowledge for the right price, but most people only did it when they gained a master to apprentice under because magic grew more and more dangerous as you dove deeper into its mysteries. Researching esoteric magic without guidance could be fatal, and as such, people needed some form of teaching to get started. The restricted section of Hogwarts Library had some fascinating books and tomes. Quinn had been quite busy greedily researching knowledge that would supplement what he already knew. In Quinn's eyes, Lockhart had finally done something worthwhile with his life by signing the permission note to the restricted section for him. Between studying, having fun, and enjoying himself, Quinn had been quite busy. Today, he found himself free from everything, lying down in the grass looking at the white clouds slowly floating in the sky. He felt as free as the clouds he was gazing at. Quinn didn't feel angry when he looked at Lockhart's stupid face. He didn't feel elated when he received the weekly sales report of Lockhart Goods. His daily run didn't leave him so tired that he wanted to sleep the entire day. He didn't randomly make his way to the kitchen to stuff his face with food. Last night's dueling lesson didn't inspire superiority inside Quinn. His eyes didn't immediately follow a group of older girls when they walked by, looking all nice. And he didn't feel the weekly bout of jealousy at Madame Hooch's excellent broom riding skill. But, even with his calm, Quinn didn't question his behavior this entire school year. He didn't even think that something was wrong with his behavior. To him, his year had been like a fun roller coaster, but nothing wrong. It was a peaceful day, and while Quinn enjoyed the time he was having for the past few months, he enjoyed this calm and quiet day. Quinn peacefully smiled and spoke without looking to his side. So, how have you been finding Hogwarts? He asked his companion, who laid in the grass with him, similarly looking at the clouds, or at least he thought she was. It is fun, but I think Nargles took some of my belongings, said the girl beside him, they are known to be quite the naughty thieves. Quinn's eyes narrowed, and he felt a bout of anger climb up into his mind. While she thought Nargles were stealing her stuff, Quinn knew better. Do you want me to help? He offered, a nasty grin forming on his face. If you leave it up to me, then Nargles would return your stuff and never, ever, and I mean it, never will they steal your stuff ever again. One word from her, and he would tear those shitheads apart, enjoying every, single, moment of the process. Luna Lovegood turned her head to face him and spoke, No, it is fine. The Nargles will return my stuff, they might be naughty, but they won't go overboard. Quinn pursed his lips and took a deep breath to curb his anger, imagining it draining into the vast ground below him. All right, but if the Nargles ever disturb you too much, tell it to me. Quinn spoke seriously, I will take care of them. Aha, uh -huh, I will call you, spoke Luna, raising her hand towards the sky as if trying to grab the clouds in her grasp. The anger finally left him, and Quinn closed his eyes, feeling the ground below him. He channeled magic into the ground around him and focused on the grass below and around him. It was a unique sensation of his magic covering thousands of blades of grass, filling them with energy, providing them with another source of vitality other than the sunlight from the glorious sun, the giver of life. Feels good, thought Quinn, a calm bliss spreading through his body and mind. He tapped into his magic core, and more ground was saturated with his magic. Quinn's magic did nothing to the ground or the grass. He didn't make his magic do anything. He was just extending his magic, nothing more or nothing less. But, in a few years, there would be a few trees growing here in the same spot, a holly tree, the tree of luck, a rowan tree, the wizard's tree, and an alder tree, the fairy's favorite tree. The relaxed boy didn't know that last night, the stars in the night sky had aligned in a special arrangement, providing him ease against the condition he was facing. A condition he knew nothing about or even knew that he had said condition. It was just the calm before the storm. Scene break. Ivy Potter looked outside the window in her dorm room. She shared the dorm room with Parvati Patil, Lavender Brown, and Hermione Granger. The presence of the four girls divided the room into four different styles. Parvati's section was all girly and a little messy. Lavender's section was similarly girly pink but a lot cleaner than her best friends. Hermione's side was filled with books and faintly smelled of parchment and ink. Her part of the room was practical. She had textbooks but didn't have as much as Hermione. Her room was neater than Lavender's but less than Hermione's. She also possessed things that a normal teenage girl would have but didn't go overboard like Parvati. Distinct from her roommates, Ivy had many pictures of her friends and family on her side's walls and table. Many happy memories were captured in the framed photos, all of them magically charmed to move, showing the happiness of the moments. The redhead's mind was filled with thoughts about the past few months. Ever since the day she and her friends have drunk polyjuice potion to get some answers, things had gone downhill. 
She was caught and blackmailed into owing an enormous debt to a guy she didn't want to owe anything at all. Ivy had felt helpless when he took her wand, even without her knowing, and trapped her inside a wall. Hermione had mixed Tracy Davis's pet cat's hair into her polyjuice potion, and it caused a reaction, turning her into a furry cat girl. Ivy's best friend had to spend a lot of time in the hospital wing, hiding from others. Her brother had found a diary with the initials TM Riddle. Ron had led them to the trophy room to show that the guy was a head boy and won an award from the school for his meritorious services. The same diary had given them a clue about the Chamber of Secrets. It turned out Tom Riddle had gotten the award because he caught the person who opened the Chamber of Secret 50 years ago. Shockingly, it was someone she knew. Rubius Hagrid, the gamekeeper at Hogwarts, and one of her dear friends had opened the Chamber of Secrets when he was attending Hogwarts. But, ever since getting the diary, Harry had gotten quiet and talked little to anybody and spent a lot of time alone. He wrote in the diary a lot, apparently talking to Tom Riddle's diary was her brother's newest obsession. But that all changed when Harry lost the diary and became irritable, taking out his anger on random people in Gryffindor. He looked for the diary a lot but couldn't find anything. Eventually, he stopped looking for the diary, and his behavior improved, but he still acted as the world owed him money. Just when Ivy thought things were improving, another attack happened, and they found a muggle-born Ravenclaw girl petrified in one of the bathrooms, lying on the floor. She was found the next day after a search when she didn't show up for any classes. Then things took another dip for the worse because the minister came for Hagrid and took him away because of all the petrifications. On top of all that, Malfoy and the Board of Governors suspended Dumbledore from his position as the headmaster. Then her brother and Ron did something stupid and went into the Forbidden Forest and almost got killed by Hagrid's deadly human flesh-loving pet, Aragog the Acromantula. An Acromantula was a giant magical species of spider. They were spiders the size of cart horses, eight-eyed, eight-legged, black, hairy, and gigantic. Ivy. Hearing her name broke her away from her thoughts, and when she looked back, she saw her best friend, a worried look on her face. Yes, asked Ivy, turning her body to face Hermione. What is happening? You have been looking stressed in the last few days, asked Hermione, moving closer and sitting on Ivy's bed. Ivy looked down at her hands, contemplating something before looking up at Hermione and saying, I, I think I know who opened the Chamber of Secrets, Ivy carefully spoke, thinking about her every word, I am not completely sure, but I think I know the identity of Heir of Slytherin. Hermione's eyes widened to the size of golf balls, and her brows disappeared up her hairline. Who is it? Ivy gulped before saying, I think it is Quinn West. Hermione's wide eyes immediately turned into a frown, Ivy, I know you don't like him, but you can't just blame Dash. Ivy grabbed Hermione's hand and cut Hermione off, I am not saying this because I don't like him. I have some reasons behind the accusation. And, what are they? Ivy looked uncomfortable for a second before stealing herself and revealing the thing she had kept a secret. The day we used the polyjuice potion, do you remember how I said I didn't make it to the Slytherin common room because I got caught up in something? Hermione nodded, not knowing where this was going. Well, West was the one who caught me, said Ivy and watched Hermione gasp. Everybody knew that Quinn West was Daphne Greengrass's friend. If Ivy met Quinn while she was transformed into Daphne, then. Ivy confirmed her doubts. He immediately recognized me and then trapped me. Ivy gritted her teeth and continued. He trapped me in a dim wall and took away my wand after a simple exchange of words. Hermione could see the anger and frustration in Ivy's eyes as she continued, it was like he already knew I wasn't Daphne even before we talked. Every sentence he spoke was a test to see if I was Daphne, Ivy told Hermione about their conversation before Ivy was trapped, how did he know I wasn't Daphne with a single look? He then somehow deduced that Crab and Goyle were Ron and Harry. It made me think, what if Heir of Slytherin could tell if a student was from Slytherin House or not, Ivy put down her theory, West saw us and immediately could tell we weren't Slytherin students and were just imposters. He blackmailed me into owing him a favor in exchange for not talking about the incident, Ivy heavily exhaled before saying, I agreed. Hermione squeezed her friend's hand and said, Ivy, I am sorry you had to go through that, she paused for a moment before continuing, but, this is just a theory. Ivy shook her head and shifted in her spot. I know, but let me tell you about Mrs. Norris' petrification, Ivy explained what she saw that day. The look of recognition in Quinn's eyes and the relief while he saw the scene. It was like he already knew this was about to happen. Who else but the heir of Slytherin, the person who opened the Chamber of Secrets, would know about the attack? Hermione was about to say that this was still not enough and just Ivy's dislike for Quinn West clouding her judgment, but Ivy raised her hand and continued. Do you know West is famous for staying outside after curfew, said Ivy, elaborating on her reasoning. I asked around, and everybody in the Ravenclaw house knows that West stays outside after curfew. He only comes back later late in the night. She grabbed Hermione's shoulders and continued. He did it the entire last year, and from what I heard, he did it every day, and not once was he caught, her voice raised as she continued, what if West was looking for the Chamber of Secrets the entire last year and found it? He didn't get caught because no one knew the chamber's location, and he stayed inside. And this year, he released Slytherin's monster. Ivy licked her lips and looked Hermione in the eye, and, I don't know how this adds up but do you remember about West's ring? Hermione frowned before nodding, yes, the gold ring, what about it? 
He didn't have it last year, and he started wearing it this year, Ivy thought about the gold ring, which caught her attention every time she looked at Quinn West, what if the ring controls the Slytherin's monster? Listening to Ivy listing off points against Quinn West did make her believe her friends, at least somewhat. I don't know, Ivy, said Hermione, there are too many what-ifs in there. I know, that is why I think that we should go to West's A.I.D office, said Ivy, he spends a lot of time in there. Maybe there is something in there. We may find something there that connects him to the Chamber of Secrets. Hermione bit on her lower lip, thinking about the petrified students. She didn't want any more to get petrified, so if they could find a lead, that would stop this. All right, I will go with you, she stood up and said, come on, we should tell the boys. Ivy grabbed her arm and stopped Hermoin. No, we can't do that. The boys would be reckless and maybe even jump west without thinking. We should do this alone. Hermione needed no more convincing, agreed. Let's do this alone. All right, when should we do this? We would need the third year schedule for Ravenclaw, Hermione thought out loud, after that, we would need to find an hour when he has a class, and we don't, so we would have time to get in his office and exit without him knowing. Ivy felt relieved when Hermione started to build a plan. Hermione taking the lead to help her friends was normal, and currently, Ivy was craving normal. It was decided. Ivy Potter and Hermione Granger were going to break into the A.I.D office owned and operated by Quinn West. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. A slash N1, so, as you can see. I introduced many changes in the canon events. So, if you commented about me messing up, I didn't because I changed the events on purpose. Asterisk. A slash N2. There is another Muggleborn student who got petrified. I added her. Hermione wasn't the next target. Change 1. Hermione didn't figure out about the Basilisk because the diary Horcrux affected Harry and withdrew into himself, not talking to people, so he didn't tell them he could hear voices, and such Hermione didn't connect his parcel tongue and voices. Change 2. Harry still hasn't figured out about Moaning Myrtle being killed by Slytherin's monster, so the timelines have been skewed. He will figure it out in maybe the next chapter or one after that change 3. Asterisk. A slash N3, if you can remember any more changes, do comment. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, underscore underscore OT underscore dash A underscore underscore D underscore underscore. Pink, underscore U underscore underscore dash L underscore X underscore underscore I underscore. Red, underscore R underscore TH dash underscore R underscore. Yellow, underscore underscore EE underscore dash underscore underscore A underscore IT I underscore. Violet, underscore R I underscore E dash S underscore P underscore underscore B underscore underscore. Green, underscore NV underscore dash underscore underscore V I underscore I underscore. Orange, underscore L underscore T T underscore N underscore dash dash underscore U L underscore. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, third year Ravenclaw, experiencing a calm day. Luna Lovegood, first year Ravenclaw, struggling from Nargles. Ivy Potter, second year Gryffindor, heir of Slytherin equals Quinn West. Hermione Granger, back from Furriness, planning for yet another infiltration. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel link of the author CR. Edit is giving below.